Okay, good afternoon. We we'll call this regular board meeting for Wednesday, May 10th, 2023, to order at 3.01 p.m. Roll call, please, Melissa. Dr. Bankus? Here. Director Daniels? Present. Director Jorgensen? Here. Director Loma? Director Loma should be joining us sometime this evening. Director Malpakum? Here. Director Nelson? Here. Director Ott? Here. So we have five board members and in person in attendance here. Director Loma should be joining us sometime soon. And Director Bankus is joining us remotely. Please join me as we observe a moment of silence. Thank you. Director Nelson, can you please make the motion to adopt the agenda? I move that the Board of Education adopts the agenda as amended by removing action item F1 contract awards as there are no contract awards. Second. Moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Director Bankus. Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Jorgensen? Aye. Director Malpakum? Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Ott? Aye. The ayes have it. The agenda has been adopted. Director Ott, can you please make the motion to enter into executive session? Yes. I move that the Board of Education convene into executive session to discuss legal advice per CRS 246402-4B, particular matters, whistleblower and parent partnership policies, internal complaint procedure, and inter interest-based bargaining with the Colorado Springs Education Association. Negotiations per CRS 246402-4E, particular matters, interest-based bargaining, IBB, with the Colorado Springs Education Association, and meet and confer with executive professionals and education support professionals, ESP, and personnel per CRS 246402-4F, Particular matter, employee workers' compensation claim. Second. Moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Director Bankus? Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Jorgensen? Aye. Director Malpakum? Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Ott? Aye. I have it. We will now enter into executive session. Executive session is a long session today. It's roughly scheduled for about two and a half hours. We will reconvene back in the for the regular board meeting at approximately 5.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Thank you. Okay, good evening, guys. Sorry to keep you waiting. Our executive session went a little bit longer than anticipated, um, but it's good conversation down there. So. so good evening to all of you. We are reconvening in public session, and there is no need to modify the agenda. For those of you who did not see the start of the meeting, the agenda was adopted as amended by removing action item F1, contract awards, as there are no contract awards. And a warm welcome to our CNN brothers and sisters who are joining us in today's meeting. So hopefully we will keep you entertained. Uh, <laughs> So as always, uh, my request to everyone in the room to be, please be respectful, civil, and courteous in all your interactions. Please follow the expected norm and professional decorum. Looking forward to a productive evening. May I please have um, Anna Lucia Ferg Ferguson from Coronado High School, Jade Schaff from Odyssey, May Holmes from Russell Middle School, Isa Maria Rodriguez from Adams Elementary School, and William Hatch from Henry Elementary School. These students are going to be leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, 
indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. That was amazing, guys. Thank you. We have some awards and recognitions, uh, and I talked to some other students out there that are getting recognized. Uh, so, Superintendent Gall, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, one of my favorite parts of our board meetings is the beginning because we get to celebrate not only uh, our success at individual uh, level, but collectively as an organization. If I could get uh, those from uh, the Mitchell Inspiration Award to come forward. Melissa, go ahead and read. Anybody? Mitchell? Wait. We are going, we're out of order. Yeah, we start with Od Great. Odyssey Echo. Great, thank you, Odyssey Echo. <laughs> Odyssey Echo Pro Start Team. Odyssey Echo Pro Start Team 2023 Colorado Pro Start Champions. The Pro Start culinary team at Odyssey Early College and Career Options placed first at the Colorado Pro Start Student Invitational, CPSI, receiving a gold medal and invitation to Washington, D.C. for the National Invitational, where they will represent Colorado teams against teams from all other states. During the culinary competition, teams prepare a restaurant caliber appetizer, entree, and dessert in just one hour using only two butane burners. Points are awarded on specific criteria such as food safety and sanitation, presentation, taste, and teamwork. The Pro Start Culinary Team is part of the D11 Career Pathways Program offered to all D11 high school oh. students through Odyssey Echo at the Roy J. Wasson Academic Campus. As state champions, students each received $21,500 in scholarships. This year's team is made up of students from three high schools, Palmer High School, Odyssey Echo, and the Bijou School. Great, let's have a round of applause for our All right, you do, I'm gonna end with you. Please introduce yourself and uh, tell us what your home school is. Uh, I'm Niren Cheng and I go to Odyssey. Great. I'm Canyon Swim and I go to Palmer. Great. My name's Anthony Bruszewski and I go to Odyssey Echo. And Olivia, you get the last word. Okay. Well, tell us what you love about the program. Okay, um, my name's Olivia Vasquez. Um, I think ProStar was the best thing that I chose to do this year. I got to meet, I got to make a lot of friendships as you could tell. I have never gotten so close with anybody with my team. Uh, I think ProStar is the best thing for students, for scholarships, as well as for you could put your mind and effort into what you love and what other people love. And mostly, everyone knows food brings family and friends. So I think ProStar's program, as well as FCCLA's program, is the best thing ever. We next have Doherty Skills USA Colorado Champions, SLSC. Four Doherty High School Skills USA student participants won state champion at the annual Skills USA Colorado State Leadership and Skills Conference, SLSC, in early April. These students were all awarded the title and will be traveling to Atlanta, Georgia in July for the National Leadership Conference. Skills USA is a partnership of students, teachers, and industry work industry working together to empower members to become world-class workers, leaders, and responsible citizens. Skills USA serves middle school, high school, and college post-secondary students preparing for careers in trade, technical, and skilled service occupations. Their mission is to improve the quality of our nation's future skilled workforce through the development of personal workplace and technical skills grounded in academics. Who's going to be the spokesperson? You are? Okay, so <laughs> introduce yourself. I'm Piper Aldrich. Grade? I'm a senior. Great. I'm Riley Stimson, and I'm a senior too. Will Winters Bottom, and I'm a junior. <laughs> I'm Shay Newmeyer. I'm a senior. Um, I really like skills because it's been a great way for me to make some new friends and um, it prepare me for the workforce. So if you're looking for a bumper sticker for CTE, that was it right there. Make friends and build skills for the workforce. Way to go. Thank you, everybody. All right, thanks. You're all.
Palmer students next. First place at um, CIRT Nationals. Seven Palmer students earned first prize for their city park slash open spaces design challenge entries in the 2023 Construction Industry Roundtable, CIRT, National Design Plus Construction Competition. These students have been invited to Washington, D.C. to present their design to a panel of judges composed of CEOs from some of the leading design and construction firms in the United States. Students under the instruction of lead mentor Joey Bonson from RTA Architects participated in the competition as part of the ACE Mentor Program at Palmer. These students went a step beyond and chose to work on a national level competition submission. They worked together to, to design Martin W. Drake Community Open Space, a city park on the space currently occupied by the Drake Power Plant downtown. The ACE Mentor Program is open to all D11 high school students. I'm Sophia and I'm in 12th grade. I'm Amina Fall and I'm in 12th grade. I'm Ruby and I'm in 10th grade. Oh, <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlie and I'm also in 12th grade. I'm Lucas, I'm also in 12th grade. I really love being in the ACE Mentor program because it um, it's allowed me the opportunity to see what my future career will look like in the real world. Um, makes it a lot more applicable to real life. It's not just theoretical. Uh, my name is Genevieve, and I'm a senior at Palmer. OK, now as we switch to the Mitchell, just uh, a little soapbox for me about CTE. We've been talking a lot about how we keep our students engaged and how we prepare them to be a part of the community that they live in, CTE is the secret to that. We've been playing with the term that a high school is supposed to be about finding your excellence <laughs> through experience. You just saw three different groups from how we do our culinary arts and food service through our life skills, and that's for all intents and purposes, that's an architectural and engineering club. And so the partnerships that we're getting, one, from our own staff who you saw standing here, as well as community partners downtown, is the way that we're going to keep our children engaged and have them prepared. Mitchell, come on forward. Mitchell Inspiration honored at Peak Parent Center State Conference. The Mitchell High School Mitchell Inspiration Team was recognized at the Peak Parent Center's State Conference as recipients of the Allies in Inclusion Award. Mitchell Inspiration was honored for their longtime practice of self-directed IEPs and the team of teachers and students work in making changes for inclusivity by presenting locally at the state level and at some virtual national conferences about their self-directed IEP journey. The Peak Parent Center is a nonprofit organization serving families and self-advocates across the state of Colorado since 1986. Their mission is a steadfast commitment to ensuring that people with all types of disabilities can be fully included in their neighborhood schools, communities, and in all walks of life. Okay, and I'm going to, we're going to introduce our students here as well. Go ahead. Anna. Great, thank you so much. And your name, sir? Logan. Logan. Marissa Cortez. Marissa Cortez. My, na my name is Junior Deal. Thank you, Junior. Another round of applause for Mitchell. And, yeah. and that comes us to the end of awards and celebrations. It was, as always, it's uh, great to celebrate uh, our students' awards and celebrations. Best wishes to all of you. Moving on to the school spotlight. Uh, it's that time of the year. It's almost the end of the year. I can't believe it. And so we are going to be celebrating some graduations. And uh, graduation uh, week starts next week. And we are going to be busy for the next couple of weeks attending a lot of high school graduations. Over to you, Superintendent Gall. 
Uh, so I'm going to fill a little bit of time. We have four minutes before we have to stop for mandatory public comment on action items. And so before we bring in the entirety of what we like to call the show, I want to just kind of do a little trip down memory lane here for uh, the folks in attendance. Uh, when we first, uh, when I first joined uh, up here on the dais, I noticed that the chance to celebrate students in schools was sitting somewhere usually about an hour and a half or two hours into the start of the meeting. And so I came to the board and I said, can we get a change in our protocol and our board policy uh, for how we run meetings to actually move what we call school spotlight and the superintendent's report to the front end. We did that out of the sole purpose of ensuring that our students and our families could be celebrated in mass, and then we get on to the work of the district. And sometimes the work of the district is hard. Uh, if we remember those transitions, we started that with the Doherty High School marching band. And for those of us that are old enough to remember Fleetwood Mac's uh, video Tusk on MTV, that was the intent, was how do we actually get the band to march in here and blow the rooftop off. Uh, and they did an excellent job. And so I think very fondly of the time of when Doherty came here and showed us that we are all here for the students. And I know, very, I know several of those students that I see often at Doherty still talk about what it meant for them to play inside the boardroom. Tonight is our last board meeting before graduation, and so I wanted to stamp it with, uh, with our, our chamber uh, choir out of Coronado. Uh, if you haven't heard them, you should, and you'll get a chance to do that tonight. Uh, the other thing that we're gonna do tonight that's slightly out of order from what we've done before is there'll be no school spotlight. Instead of trying to figure out who's the last school that gets recognized, we thought instead, how do we celebrate all the schools by representation of the children that are at what we call matriculation points. Students that come into our kindergarten opportunities, fifth graders who choose a District 11 school in sixth grade, eighth graders who then go on to ninth grade, and students who are succeeding in what we call our opportunity academies. So we have representation of each one of those matriculation points who will come to the dais and tell us a little bit about what they love about District 11, and then in quick turn, thank the teacher or administrator who's made a difference in their time here. And I have how much more time, Melissa, to fill? I think we're at. Can we two more minutes? Can can do? You, would you like to opine on the wrap uh, end of the year here? <laughs> okay, if we can. Uh, uh, well, I can open it up for the rest of the board too, if they want to opine. But uh, one of the, uh, as a school board member, often we have to face challenging situations. But one of the best um, things for me this year has been watching students come up here, take the superintendent's chair, and also giving recognitions to the teachers. It's priceless watching our students come up and speak out here, and seeing how confident these students are. Sometimes I'm nervous, and when I go and talk to the student, I was just talking to her right at the front up there, and I was saying, I'm nervous up there, and she said, like, I'm going to be nervous too, so we're going to squeeze each other's <laughs> hands when she comes up here, and she's going to be good, and I'm going to be good. But uh, thank you, Superintendent Gall, for bringing students up here and spotlighting them at the very beginning. I'm looking forward to graduations too next week and the week after, I'm sure all our um, uh, board members are looking forward to. Uh, that's kind of one of the highlights, watching our students walk up that graduation stage with big smiles on their faces, year to year grinning, and they are celebrating their uh, four year achievement out there. Uh, and it's not easy for these group of students that are graduating. They were, I think, uh, the freshman class that uh, got hit with COVID and um, um, uh, schools closed and uh, uh, life changed for them. So now seeing freshman or the sophomore class, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, anyway, um, it's good to see these students rise up over the obstacles that were in their way and now they are set to go there and uh, make a difference in the outside world. Great. Are we there? there. Okay. So now we go to public hearing on the Mill override plan amendments to program implementation plan, and I have two people, or oh, one, one person signed, or oh, two, two signed up here. First one is uh, Ken Davis. Mr. Davis. Good evening. You have three minutes. Oh, so thank you. I'm Ken Davis. I was the previous chair of the Mill Levy Committee for four years. I'm not part of that committee anymore. My subjects are the two cell, 2017 PIP 12, Mitchell Promise, and the PIP 13 UPK planned amendments. 
please forgive me, I just had oral surgery, so this isn't working too well. The Mitchell Promise. This program was implemented before funding even had been properly approved. Colorado statutes changed to allow MLO funds for scholarships, but that postdates the levy, Mill Levy Initiative by four years, an obvious cart before the horse. The UPK, you had ESSER money, started current programs for your pre-K activities, but those funds are going away. Previous district programs for pre-K expenditures did not provide any viable increase in student enrollments, all right? So these two amendments together apprise approximately $4 million over the next several years. So I attended the two MLO meetings where these amendments were presented. First one was on March 21st. The committee discussed, discussion noticed that the, these two PIPs may be great ideas, but they're outside the scope of the MLO initiative, which is K through 12 only, not before kindergarten and not after graduation. So both amendments were rejected by vote for this single reason. Since that vote failed, the administration called an emergency meeting for April 3rd. Agenda was made to try to influence the members to change their votes by a re-vote. Robert's rules were suspended to force the meeting to proceed over the objection of some of the committee members. The results, the amendments were rejected again. So the administration has ignored the MLO vote and pushed the amendments through the DAC to this meeting. Problem is, these actions constitute a clear breach of good faith to the taxpayers who granted that mill levy, expecting the promise of peers being in a citizen's oversight committee. But, and instead you've reduced the MLO to basically a rubber stamp committee, even if it continues to exist. So I'm suggesting board members, there are too many breaches of normal business practices, too many questionable actions surrounding these two amendments for you to proceed in good faith. The solution is to simply admit that the anticipated funding is not available, deny the two amendments, and move on. Instead, I would suggest, why don't we find a good new viable plan to use that $4 million that is actually applicable in the classroom where the mill levy money was initiated to be activated. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Nora Brown. Hi, um, I'm Nora Brown, former uh, D11 board member, 2011-2019. I'm here to speak to the two um, levy override plan amendments, the Mitchell Promise and the Universal Pre-K for um, three-year-olds, that the Mill Levy Override Oversight Committee voted against not once, but twice. The issue is not the merit of these two programs, but whether they align with the 2017 ballot question the voters approved. The Oversight Committee, which was also approved by the voters on that ballot question, is charged to ensure that the district honors the intent of the ballot question and the will of the voters. As a member of the school board that drafted that question, the inclusion of a Citizen Oversight Committee was critical to getting voter approval. I confirmed with the Communications Director for that campaign, who said it was a major selling point, and it also helped that the district had just won a national award for its MLO governance which included citizen oversight. After the committee voted against these amendments, the plans went to the District Accountability Committee where members were not given the ballot question or had a discussion of how they might align to the ballot question. Gaining and maintaining voter trust is a huge effort. I feel the district is doing what the voters feared most, using MLO money to um, fund whatever pet, pro pet project it wants. Not only is this ethically wrong, but when you go back to the voters for a bond or a mill, a mill levy, overriding the oversight committee will be a huge mistake and a point that a no campaign will definitely use against you. You have other options to fund these programs. Please do not use MLO money to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all I have as far as public comments for this portion of the agenda item. So I'll turn it over to you, Superintendent Gall, and the Coronado, the ensemble choir. The, <laughs> Coronado Chamber Choir. Chamber, okay. Welcome. Okay, the floor is yours. Under the direction of uh, Jeff Hodder as well. Hodder, thank you.
evening. This is Stephen Collison's Below Home. A spokes, spokesperson, May. Who's May? Are you May? You're May. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your time in the choir and what it means to you to be able to perform here tonight? Yeah, so um, my time in the Coronado Choir has been absolutely amazing. Um, Mr. Hoder is a fantastic choir teacher, and um, I guess what it means to me is since freshman year, I've never been like a very good singer, and Mr. Hoder has definitely given every single person that joins his program the opportunity to become a good singer. Like, I've had all the tools at my disposal to improve and get better every single day. And that's just been incredible. So, yeah. I'll give you your, your name and your grade and pass it down. Callie Schultz, 11th grade. 
Ren Fortier, 12th grade. Isabella Carlinas, 11th grade. Uh, May Schaefer, 12th grade. Katie Shane, 12th grade. Dakota Myers, 10th grade. Nicholas Witten, 12th grade. Michael Watkins, 12th grade. Solana Inau, 10th grade. Vera Scar, 10th grade. Sal Himeo, 10th grade. As Arnell, 10th grade. Anihi Marin, 11th grade. Sabrina Laswell, 11th grade. Noah Smith, 10th grade. Cole Harden, 12th grade. Jeff Hoder. I went to Jackson, Chapita, Holmes, and graduated from Coronado. <laughs> And I heard a lot of not 12th graders, which means you'll be even better next year. How amazing was that? Let's give a round of applause again. Okay, as I uh, stated earlier, we're going to do it a little different tonight, so I'm going to ask our uh, five matriculating students to come on forward here, and I'll give each one of you a chance. Uh, please, when you sit down in the chair, uh, state the prompt that you were asked to answer, and then you can get to thanking your teacher who will be on screen. So I think you're up first, Anna. Come forward. That's the gift. Whoa, okay. Now you get to make all the decisions. Okay. That's probably not a good idea. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Hi, my name is Ana Lucia Ferguson, um, and I'm here to mention my positive experiences with School District 11. Uh, oh, and my prompt was 10 years from now, what will I remember fondly about School District 11? So. 10 years from now, I will remember the unwavering support I gained from Steele Elementary School the room to grow and discover my passions with Holmes Middle School, and the countless academic and extracurricular opportunities at Coronado High School. All of that has made these last 12 years in D11 <coughs> unforgettable. Because of the community service options D11 has presented to me, I have been able to participate in Cougars Care. For those of you who don't know, Cougars Care is a nonprofit organization at Coronado High School that is geared towards meeting the tangible needs of students that prevent them from fully participating in their education. So this can include anything from food, clothing, and school supplies. With our new food distribution center called The Corner Market, we have helped over 1,000 students this year from, with items from a granola bar to a week's worth of groceries. My experiences and dedication to this program has inspired me to use my fashion designer dreams to create an affordable clothing line for the less fortunate all over the world. Next year, I'll be studying design and merchandising at CSU Fort Collins. I would like to thank D11 for all that you've done for me these past 12 years. Without you, I would not be the person I am today, nor would I have been able to discover my passions. Thank you. And are your teachers yeah. right? asking us to stand up? Yes. Can I have my Cougars Care Director, Brent Urban, stand up? Come on forward. Come on. This guy. <laughs> Yeah, um, in the email I got, it said that you're supposed to re recognize a teacher who gets stuff done. Um, and I think Mr. Urban is the definition of someone who gets stuff done. Uh, he is involved in so many things, in charge of so many things. Um, I don't really know how he does it half the time. Um, but he shows up every morning with a smile on his face and asks us how our day, days are in the morning, and he always remembers our responses. Uh, Mr. Ur Urban inspires me to keep smiling during stressful times because he does it every day. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I don't know if Anna mentioned this. She was the recipient of the Best and the Brightest Award from the Gazette this year. One of our two students that received that award. Can uh, Jade from Odyssey come on forward? There you are. You get the big chair. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Jade. I am from Odyssey Early College and Career Options. And the prompt that I was given today is, what will you be most proud of when considering your journey in the Colorado Springs District 11? Besides being able to represent my district in many different forms, what I'll be most proud of is when considering my journey in D11 was being able to push myself past my limits. D11 prepared me in ways that I would not be able to get anywhere else. From going to flight school, excelling in AFJROTC, excelling in high school and college, and being able to be here and tell you that I am mo what I'm most proud of. D11 <coughs> brought me to Odyssey Echo, a school that taught me being comfortable is not a sign of growth. We grow our most when we are placed in uncomfortable situations. Having this mindset taught me to push past my limits and to be, here, to be more than who I was when I began this journey called high school. Now that it is coming to an end, I feel more than ready and prepared to take those next steps to even higher things. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my perspective. Great, and you want to thank Dr. Uh, Dr. Mingo? Um, Call her, make, make him stand up there. Oh, I would like to thank, thank Dr. Um, Melinda Joy Mingo. She is not here tonight. She's at a speaking engagement. Um, she is one of the people, one of the main people who pushed me to be, <coughs> Be more here, be more present in my community, and to speak on things that I think need to be spoken on, and being able to broadcast my voice to those that I think need to hear it. Can we get uh, May Holmes uh, moving from eighth grade out of Russell? Um, my name is May Holmes. I'm an eighth grader at Russell Middle School. Um, I was told to come up here to recognize a teacher of my choice. And I would like to take that time to recognize Mr. Ricks because he, was, he has impacted so many students by being kind, funny, and always, always um, willing to listen and give advice on problems that aren't even school related. Um, he... Um, He's the kind of teacher that every student needs. Uh, he always pushes you to do your hardest. He's um, a whoa. Um, even when you can't, even when you feel like you can't. Um, he's a teacher who will support you no matter what, and a teacher who is willing to be your best friend when you need it. Um, Mr. Ricks is one of my favorite teachers, and I'm so glad I get to represent him up here tonight for you all. Um, thank you. Mr. Ricks? He's not here. He's not here either. Okay, if we can get uh, William Hatch uh, from Henry Elementary School. Come on up, William. Is, is Ms. Bursnick uh, here? Ms. Bursnick. Thank you. Can you come forward so we can uh, have you celebrated as well? Go ahead. Your chair there, big man. You stand right there so we'll get the camera on you. Perfect. I'm sure. You're doing great. Our microphone will get there. Yeah. And let everybody know what question you're answering, your best memory. Um, the question that I'm answering today is, what is my favorite memory in elementary school? Hi, my name is William Hatch. I am a fifth grader student at Henry, Patrick Henry. I have been attending Patrick Henry Elementary since my kindergarten year in 2017. In my opinion, Patrick Henry is a wonderful school. I've had many memorable experiences there, and it's hard just to pick one. From the individual help and support to large group activities and learning experiences, Patrick Henry always supports my classmates and I to achieve our goals. That being said, my most fondest memory is the, fi is the fifth grade camping trip to Estes Park for three days and two nights. Of course, it was expected for me and my friends to have a blast, but we also learned many life lessons that we will carry with us far beyond our school years. Some of the most important lessons that we learned were survival skills, problem solving, as well as learning to work as a team, helping build stronger friendships, and establishing trust. I've enjoyed my time learning at Patrick Henry, and I am sad to leave those familiar hallways, but I will still cherish the friendships I've built with the teachers and staff at Henry. Great. And what do you want to say about your teacher? Um, 
Miss B, I would say she is one of the best fifth grade teachers in elementary schools, and she's the best. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hatch. If I could get uh, Issa to come on forward. Your speech, don't forget your speech. You did, thank you. You can sit there. And we've asked Issa to tell us what is her favorite activity. My favorite activity is, well, my name is Issa Maria Abigail Rodriguez. My favorite activity is, is science and math because, because we get to learn how to count and and to to do new numbers and who's your teacher that you want to say thank you to i i thank my teacher miss benicky and she is not here today because she's uh so She's taking care of business. <laughs> Thank you so much, you said. Great job. <laughs> I, I appreciate everyone's patience uh, and the way we're trying to transition the climate and the culture of our organization. And if you don't just feel overpowered with joy and warmth to hear award winners in the beginning, mu musical performances, and then just the incredible, sincere, and articulate uh, thanks that comes from our students for their D11 experience. Uh, we believe that we are the Colorado Springs School District 11, and we believe in new math. We believe that one plus one equals 11. So we're proud to be here, and uh, I'll get on with the show. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try and go through these pretty quickly to keep the meeting moving along. I wanted to start introducing some of our higher ed relationships. Uh, we live in a town rich of higher ed opportunities. I happen to live not far from Colorado College, so I see their campus and their students all the time. On the left here is an opportunity where we had um, students participating in a soccer camp. Um, I've, many of you know I'm an academy grad, and one of the things we always hated at the academy is we lost a CC in soccer, lacrosse, and hockey every year and regularly. We beat them in football just because they didn't have a football team. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's a huge opportunity for our students to get exposure to that type of clinic and those type of coaches. Uh, 41 D11 students participated on the day, and so that's what's on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is I wanted to address this uh, the, the Stroud Scholars Program that CC uh, and the Stroud family family have put forward. It is a no-cost three-year program where they take uh, students in and around Colorado Springs into cohorts at the end of their freshman year and give them three successive summer experiences. And the first class, the first gro cohort graduated just uh, a couple of days ago that I was able to attend. And they were students from all over the city. And you can see our students that were highlighted there in the class of uh, 23 in that first cohort. I had the good experience to uh, spend some time with Kenna uh, Vidal from Mitchell High School. and. Um, and uh, uh, the, the other, uh, Lu Lucira Romero from Coronado. Uh, these are two tremendous young women who are going on to incredible opportunities that uh, are helped perpetuated and uh, continued by incredible relationships like we have with CC and the, and the Stroud family. You can see, especially what we love to see with our relationships with higher ed, is an inaugural cohort of only five District 11 students, but you can see that continue to grow over time, particularly with the size of uh, the class of 25. So if you know any of these students, ask them, what is it that they like about that, and how can we continue to build and create deeper and longer relationships with higher ed? Students are not prepared to be successful in life in today's market with just a high school diploma. We have to redefine public education, not as K-12, but as pre-K to at least 14. It is happening all across America. The uh, governor has implemented a universal pre-K program, and we also know that there are many states and cities who offer community college for free as part of the tax base. 
Uh, this is just a wonderful slide that I received of our award winners. Many of these have been celebrated before in our Governor's Bright Spot in math. I spoke uh, a lot about Chapita and Roosevelt, but I wanted just a moment for all our community to see that we have award-winning schools, and you can see them uh, strewn here across our city and in uh, variable different opportunities. Hats off to all the schools that are recognized here, and we expect to continue to see this grow. Uh, earlier this year, we talked a lot about attendance, and we said, you can't learn if you're not at school. So one of the things that we go over weekly now are attendance measures uh, across the regions as uh, part of our K-12 area superintendents. And so you can see the schools that are here. I won't go through each one of them, but I want to highlight some of the actions that they've taken to increase their attendance rates. Obviously, deeper community engagement, but by partnering with nonprofits, nonprofits to help them connect with families, make phone calls, using activity buses to go solve transportation solutions that we're not able to get to with just a regular yellow bus, conducting home visits, doing morning staff meetings to identify which students are not there, and immediately making the phone call, not waiting till the end of the day. Some schools are committed to new class stores where they use positive uh, uh, behavior, positive-based behavior interventions so students are motivated to earn points so they can go buy what we call tchotchkes or little trinkets about their school in the stores. Uh, and I really want to highlight in some of the places that we've had harder to serve students in our opportunity schools, although the numbers might not be um, uh, above the averages that we're looking for, we saw a 9% increase at Tesla. And at one point, we reached over 85% of our students attending at Bijou High School. Uh, if you focus on attendance, you can find the ways to get children to come to school. I applaud every one of our school leaders, every one of our staff members, and particularly every one of our community members and families who are doing that one extra shake of a student's shoulder in the morning that says, come on, it's time to go. We need you in school. We're ready for you to be in school. We're committed to spending the extra time and effort for you to be there. Uh, I have a new plan. I've decided the best way to prepare for board meetings is to spend all <laughs> Wednesday morning in schools. And so I'm going to go through a series of schools that I visited this morning, just as some shout outs and highlights of what I saw of schools getting stuff done. This is Isaiah from Mr. Peterson's fifth grade cl class at Scott. They were doing a genius, uh, a genius hour, which they'd been working on all year long. Uh, Isaiah actually used a 3D printer to build, sand, paint, program and put mechanical devices in his own Iron Man helmet. If anybody's ever spent over $100 on a toy like this, you ought to just ask Isaiah to make you one because it's uh, it is much more functional and probably the coolest thing I've seen come out of a fifth grader's mind in a long time. Uh, so a future uh, superhero in the making there for us. <laughs> Uh, this is a scene today at Odyssey, uh, our early college over at the Wasson campus. And the man's back that you see there is a reporter, Michael Booth, from uh, the Colorado Sun. He was engaging with our ninth grade biology class, Ms. Powell's class, on water rights. The students had just finished a project on understanding uh, what are the challenges that we face out west with water. Anybody paying attention to the mayor's race knows that one of the hot topics is water rights. What was so critical to this was not the idea of just bringing in a guest speaker, but was seeing students having to argue both sides of what they think are solutions and or challenges to water rights. So we are developing critical thinkers that can't just that we're not asking them just to articulate their point. We're asking them to understand the other point. One of the most engaging sidebar conversations I had was, should it be about limiting what we water our lawns, or should it be limiting how we use water in other ways? And so it was interesting to see students without lawns were all about limiting watering lawns, and students, you know, perhaps with, uh, with uh, other desires uh, or sports wanted to have access to water fountains in the city. And so it was great to see our students engaged in that critical thinking. I had a good, I also had the chance to stop by Palmer High School today, and uh, on my way out, I bumped into our McKinney Vinto team uh, and m many members of the uh, Palmer staff who are resupplying uh, the supplies that they give to uh, the homeless children that were support at uh, Palmer High School. I want to make sure I get all the names here right. In the upper left is uh, Ms. Donovan, and then we have from the Palmer, who's, who runs our McKinney Vinto team, and then from the Palmer team, an already once recognized GSD award winner in Carlos Santos. And then my, my favorite counselor is uh, Ms. Uh, Cordova, who I've had several conversations with. Our school resource officer in the back, Jennifer. And then if you haven't been paying attention, that's our new principal for Palmer High School, Krista Burke on the right, holding the water bottle with the backpack on. 
Island. So hats off to the folks at Palmer doing above and beyond. I was then over at Doherty today, and that's uh, uh, there's a lot of people on stage there. But most importantly, my GSD award is to Ryan Reed, who leads our drama department. He happens to be the bushy hair next to the bandana, so I apologize for the poor quality of the photo. And this was our Doherty High School Big Six, uh, Big Hero Six production. This is an inclusive theater class, uh, which is uh, it was a packed house there today with students and staff. And inclusive theater is a class where students in special education are the the stars of the show as the script is adapted and customized to meet the needs of all. And so Ryan has taken this work on at Doherty, and it's been such an incredibly impactful um, opportunity for him as a person and a teacher, and for the students that he's serving on stage there, and for all of the, the Doherty community, that uh, Ryan has taken on the idea of now building this out across all of our comprehensive high schools. And so we'll begin to do that and hopefully have that ready in the 24-25 school year. Uh, hats off to Ryan and, and all the team there. It was a great event. Uh, we'll never miss a Teacher Tuesday. You can see all the folks here. I just ask that you take a look uh, online and, and pay attention to uh, the accolades that we have for our teachers here. We love being able to celebrate our teachers. Nobody learns without a teacher. And then I just want to give a, a quick human resource update. Uh, we are ahead of schedule of where we were last year. Uh, it's been brought up of the high number of resignations that we have seen in the spring. The good news is we have more hires and we have resignations. Overall, we still have 106 vacancies to fill, and I recognize that that is a deep, deep hole. But know that we went more than half of this year with 86 vacancies. So we have 20 more teachers to fill to be more prepared than we were last year. We will not rest until we fill every position. Uh, the largest area of concern continues to be special ed. 40% of our vacancies that I shared at 106 are in special ed. I'll be coming to the board with uh, specific incentives uh, for us to be able to accelerate special ed hiring. And then uh, let's get uh, just a round of applause to summarize where we got to in hiring this year. Um, I, if you are here in the audience and your name is on that board, please stand up to be recognized. And if you're not, uh, we will bring you forward another time. And here comes our new assistant principal from uh, MAN, uh, Carrie Lindemann. Hi, Carrie. Welcome to the team. Great. I'm going to hand it off to Velvet here in a second, but I can't take, uh, I can't miss the opportunity to end the last really large board meeting for the year without thanking my executive cabinet. This was a, t a team picture that we took at the beginning of the year, and I always like to think about the quality of your ability to manage change over time by the number of people that are still standing with you a year out. And so a year out, we're all still standing. Uh, and when we, we might all have lost a little bit of hair and it might be a little grayer than it was before, but I have never seen a team be more responsive to positive change for students. And so I want to acknowledge each one of my executive, executive cabinet members, if they could all please stand up and just take a round of applause from the community that's listening today. Okay, Velvet, you want to come forward? Thank you. This is one of my favorite weeks because I love to make teachers happy. And so it's been great. I spent all day at one school today. I'll probably spend a lot of time tomorrow. But thank you to teachers. Um, I'm happy tonight. Moving toward broad acceptance and implementation of family, school, and community engagement requires a coordinated effort dedicated to linking and supporting parents, teachers, administrators, researchers, and policymakers who are committed to developing effective policies, programs, and practices. The research supports that the work that these partnerships promote, they promote student success. So as part of the work of the D11 Family, School, and Community Partnerships Collaborative, we support schools, but we also want to celebrate the work being done at our schools. So the celebration subcommittee, which is, includes Jennifer Schulte, Nancy Marshmello, and myself, Velvet Stepanek, are here to celebrate D11, some more D11 schools tonight. Uh, I always want to go ahead and bring up the definition of what is family, school, and community partnership. This definition is provided by the Depart Colorado Department of Education, and I just want to call out that the key is active partnering. Student success is everyone's job, 
Just as a space launch refer relies on a team of people working together to plan and complete a mission, families, schools, and communities work together to launch student success. Opportunities take off when we work together. And then I just want to remind you again of the four essential elements from the Colorado Department of Education, creating an inclusive culture, building trusting relationships, design capacity, building opportunities, and dedicate necessary resources. We already had some examples tonight of what D11 schools are working to do to provide opportunities for everyone. Uh, so we're going to celebrate a couple of different areas tonight. So first, this month we chose to highlight Penrose Elementary School, and then we're, instead of doing a school, I, I wanted to really highlight the community resource night that was held at Mitchell for their work to launch student success. And we hope that you can see the, some of those elements in, in the work, um, the essential elements in the work that's being done at these schools. At that school. So first we're going to start with Penrose Elementary. Penrose Elementary is in a beautiful neighborhood in Village 7. It is part of the southeast area and, and Sherry Callback is the, is the area superintendent. Penrose Elementary School has had a full year of community and family events. They've hosted over 10 afternoon and weekend events for students and families and have seen a tremendous turnout from their community. Some of their events have had upwards of 500 people attending and their hallways and gyms were packed with pride in the Penrose community and experience. Penrose hired a new community liaison this year for this school year with ESSER funds. <coughs> And this, oh, you know, I forgot to do part. I, I want to make sure if anybody's from Penrose and anybody that helped with the Mitchell Resource Night, could they stand up first? Because I want, I want to call them out. I forgot to do it. Rebecca, you need to stand up too. Um, so that community liaison set out the year to create a new sense of community for the school, a sense of community for the school and the surrounding businesses and organizations. The year began with a camping night with barbecue, hot dogs, and campfires in the library to read by. In November, they hosted the first annual Penrose Block Party, highlighting local businesses, free student haircuts, food, dancing, and community gathering in the neighborhood. Each Penrose family could leave this event with a free Thanksgiving meal. We, they partnered then with their area high school, Mitchell, for a toy drive at Christmas where each, new student, each student was able to enjoy a new gift from the, their friends at Mitchell High School. In March, we, they had students and families use their makerspace classroom to make leprechaun traps together, and they partnered with the PTA for the Read Across America Night, complete with an In-N-Out Burger truck. Each of their Title I events were organized by a group of dedicated staff who planned, created, and engaged families. And this, they, they're bringing the same energy back in two weeks with their summer send-off event. And during this event, students and families can visit Penrose and then enjoy events, enjoy events in the Penrose parking lot or visit the church down the street where they will have food, games, and things for families to do. This collective party is a way of celebrating the school year, our students, and our community. Penrose can't wait to build on this momentum for the next school year and see what we can bring our students, families, and community. Thank you, Penrose. So let's go ahead and give Penrose another round of applause. So our, the second spotlight I wanted to bring up to is the community resource night that was held at Mitchell High School on April 27th. One of the things we talked about in our collaborative lesson was that a lot of times we don't hear enough from our non-English speaking families. Families from, from, the, from the Mitchell area, which included all the schools up there, all families were invited um, to dinner, to eat dinner, and to connect. And a concerted effort was made to invite non-English speaking families. Uh, it really was a great opportunity for them to be together. Families were able to learn about resources available to them in Colorado Springs. They connected with organizations that help with accessing food for free, mental health services, housing, and much, much more. Translators were readily available at the event so that all families felt welcome. Families were able to visit community tables, visit with each other, and gather valuable information. They got a passport stamped at each station, and then they were eligible to win prizes. I was invited there to provide information on the district accountability 
committee and this and this and school accountabilities uh, accountability committees I also talked about the mission that we all have to launch student success and the importance of hearing all of our family voices the evening ended with a, everyone sharing a meal together what a great opportunity to make all families feel valued and then I know some of these names are small, but I just wanted to put up there, putting this event together was done through the work of an amazing team of teachers, community members, community liaisons, district translation providers, students, administrators, the family engagement coordinator, and parents. Um, thank you to all of the people listed there. It was, it was a lot of work for them to put it together, uh, to have translators there to help support all those families. And I, it really, it really, if, if you had been there, it was, it was a great event. It felt really good to be there. Um, I wish more of you could have come, and because and, that's the families we don't hear enough from. So I, the plan is to try to have more of those in each area next year, and I, and I hope that you guys will be there and, and um, listen to them. Uh, one final celebration even this is I want to Luann DeCleva, Natasha Davis, and myself celebrated the D11 Family School and Community Partnership accomplishments with the Colorado Department of Education and 80 other representatives from school districts across the state last week at the Colorado FSCP retreat in Estes Park. We, from that, after that, on the way home from that retreat, we started working on plans for our work next year, and we hope to continue to celebrate the FSCP work done at D11 schools. So thank you to Penrose Elementary and all the people who organized the Mitchell Resource Night uh, for, sharing, for sharing their bright spots uh, and their, their work for family school community partnerships to launch student success. So if, if those people that were here, if they could stand up again and we could give them a round of applause, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Hey, Luann, you're supposed to stand up as well. No, you have to, because I need to introduce Jessica, too. And so uh, Lu Luann is uh, finishing a, an incredible career here at District 11, leading D D11 Engage. And you can see the way she weaves into all the work that we do in partnership with our community. And in her retirement, we are excited to introduce our new D11 Engage leader, Jessica Wise. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you. That was some exciting information that you had to share, especially the Coronado Choir right at the very top. Um, and uh, Velvet, uh, thank you for also presenting those uh, FSCP reports throughout the uh, last several months. Uh, and I know on the night uh, the Mitchell event was scheduled, there was four other school events on the same time, five. Yeah, so, there were so many conflicts. So, um, But thank you for providing a report. Moving on to public comments. We have public comments. One of these days, you're going to say, I'm looking forward to no public comments. Uh, we encourage public comments. Going over the board protocol, um, as I reminded at the outset, uh, board meetings are primarily business meetings for the orderly and efficient conduct of the business of the district. And as highlighted in our board priorities, we are very interested in building trust and transparency by listening to the community feedback as it helps us deliver, as it helps us better do our work. The clear expectation is that this feedback is provided in a civil, professional, and courteous manner without resorting to personal attacks and disparaging remarks. So please be respectful of everyone, board members, staff, and audience, and maintain the expected professional decorum in the boardroom. It's preferred that you do not single out any one person in your comments, but if you choose to do so, the expectations are that you will address them respectfully. Each of you have three minutes for your comment. A clock will be displayed on the screen to help you through that. Please monitor the clock as you can get through your comments in three minutes. Uh, if you want to show support or solidarity to a speaker, please stand as the speaker is talking or use a silent applause. Students come first, followed by action, non-action, and general comments. And if you signed up under action and non-action, please st stick to those items. In your comments, are not deviate outside the agenda items. Um, we've, we have allocated a total of one hour for public comments, and hopefully we can get through all these. Uh, lastly, the statements made by the public do not reflect the views of the board of the district. With that, 
We do have a D11 student here first. Yeah, we have a couple of stu D11 students. Um, so the first student, Michelangelo Krusen. Hello, my name is Michelangelo Krusen. I'm a freshman at Palma High School. This is not my first time up here. I have put on a suit and stood up here to speak to you before. I have appeared in the newspaper and spoken directly to several of you. I am a freshman and this is my first year in a D11 public high school. I attend Palmer High School, which is widely accepted to be very accepting. I was told I was brave and had confidence after the first time I spoke to you. But I did not have the confidence to correct people on my pronouns or my name. I doubt I could even correct my favorite teachers. If someone who is held as brave doesn't have the courage to tell people their pronouns, what part of you believes that a shy kid could do it? So many people have told you that nobody is ever forced to give their pronouns. And if a teacher forces a kid to give their pronouns, that is wrong. It's been explained to you that asking for pronouns will help students. And it has been explained to you that pronouns are not asked publicly. And any student can say no. But you are scared of the district losing some money over a few that will take their kids out of school over pronouns. What about the students that will join D11 public schools? I personally know several people that moved from charter schools to public schools. For all of them, the inclusivity and diversity of D11 schools was a major selling point, particularly the inclusivity of LGBTQ plus students. I chose Palmer for its inclusivity. I do not live around here. I live 20 minutes out in D20. If you remove teachers' ability to ask for pronouns, you will remove the ability for safe spaces to exist taking away the safety of your students. The school board's job is supposed to be to help D11 students, not to harm them. As I said in my first speech to you, rules are typically made for one of two reasons, either to help students or to keep them safe. Who does this rule on names and pronouns help? Who does it keep safe? If you pass the pronoun rule, it will destroy your students' <coughs> mental health and general well-being further than school already does. And to speak in terms you understand, you will lower your graduation rate and average grades. Are you willing to do that for fear of losing a few books? You will lose students no matter what you do. With that being known, please make the moral decision. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Ian Schreiner. Again, a student from Palmer High School. Yeah, that I am. Freshman as well, coincidentally. I uh, think you've been here before too. Yes, actually. So, ladies and gentlemen of the board, last fall I stood before you to talk about teachers who really helped me at the beginning of high school. Now, I am up here today at the end of my freshman year to remind you of the incredibly important role. Where was I? Okay, where was I? <laughs> of the incredibly important role and figure that teachers serve in students' lives. Teachers throughout the eight hours a day, five days a week that they spend with us have become our mentors and treasured advisors in our high school life. They teach us the skills and knowledge that we need for the future. In addition, I can say with full confidence that all of my teachers will support my advancement through learning and above all, all my teachers influence me in a unique way that will no doubt help me in the future. And with that being said, you can't pay them any differently from one another simply based on a fictional standard. You can't label a teacher's effectiveness using only a check. You can't label such brilliant minds like Mr. Ferguson, Dr. Barquette, Mrs. Fletcher, Mr. Lewis, Mr. Joyner, Ms. Henson, and Mr. Wybrandt using only a check. And to these teachers and all others, thank you for all that you do to make our futures better. And to the board, I implore you, Listen to the teachers. They know what they're doing. And also, P.S., please approve the science research course submitted by Mr. Lohman. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Brent Fortier. And you are from Coronado? Oh, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. I'm Ren Fortier. I'm a senior at Coronado High School. And I apologize for the speech being a bit more harsh, harsh, but this is the third time that I've spoken before this board, and I've lost my capacity for niceties about this topic. I'm quite frankly rather disgusted with the actions of this board that claims to be representative of student safety, student needs, and just generally caring for students. Superintendent Gall recently called students into this building during a protest in order to discuss with students why they were protesting. 
They proceeded to continually silence my dear friend Stanley Serby, who is also a student at Coronado High School, who happens to be trans whenever Stanley tried to bring up this issue. And Superintendent Gall listened to every single other person in the room, every word, and all of them, most of them at least, were in fact cisgender. At the last board meeting I attended, I was unaware until a few weeks ago when I was informed by one of my teachers that Director Loma, who is unfortunately not here right now, felt that it was appropriate to attempt to shout into his mic at me, you're a woman, while I was challenging actively the pronoun policy because not everyone's insides match what they look like. To add on to that, if he's looking at the main identifying factors that tell him I am a woman, I would be very interested to hear what Moms for Liberty, people who are not a part of D11 and come to attend these meetings in support of these hateful policies would have to say about a board member objectifying and sexualizing students. A little more than a year ago, Vice President Jorgensen posted a transphobic meme on his personal Facebook page. Within less than a week of this post, an Instagram page was created by a student attending my high school, taking the name of my high school, under the name of coronado.kill.lgbtq. Listed on this evening's agenda is something discussing Mental Health Awareness Month. In honor of this, I would like to ask those of you on the board in support of the proposed policy two questions. Have you ever known a student who attempted to or succeeded to commit suicide because someone asked them their preferred name and pronouns? And have you ever known a student who attempted or succeeded in committing suicide because someone did not? Because I certainly have known the latter, as well as students who self-harm because they're not being accepted in their schools. If this policy is to ever pass in Colorado Springs School District D11, this school board would actively have deaths of students on their hands. I want all of you to know who support this policy that if you don't change some perspectives very quickly to truly listen to students and what they need, the class of 2023 who are all of voting age now will still be voting from their colleges as long as their addresses are here in Colorado Springs. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to non-action items. Um, Cheryl Saylor. Good evening, board, Superintendent Gall, and community members. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we once again ask your blessings on our school board members for their continuing commitment to the children in this district. We're especially grateful for all of the hard work and efforts by our board and staff members over the recent contract negotiations. Thanks to you for giving them the strength to stick with it until the best outcome for our teachers can be achieved. Please open the eyes of our teachers to recognize the blessings this board is working so hard to achieve for them. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I would like to acknowledge this evening our board's efforts in putting forth the new parental partnership. We are at a time in our history where there seems to be a trend toward wanting to take parents out of the process of educating their children. And even in some cases, wanting to remove the word parent from the education process. To the credit of our board, they have constantly recognized that parental involvement in their children's education almost always results in greater academic achievement for the child. And now they have put forth a document to declare their intent to work side by side with parents to provide the best educational experience possible for each child. I, for one, am very grateful to have a board who not only acknowledges the value of the parental involvement, but has the courage to make it a definitive part of how District 11 intends to operate. The title of this document solidifies that this is a partnership. Both the District 11 school system and the parents have responsibilities to ensure each child is met where he is to provide the best possible opportunities for his success. A key component to me is that the district is responsible to provide transparency to the parents as they have every right to know what is going on for their child while they are in the care of the education system. 
Once again, I salute our board for their efforts to move D11 forward, to reach the high academic achievement and enrollment goals we all have. Having seen the latest test scores at the most recent board work session, it is evident we all still have a lot of work to do, a long ways to go. However, a lot of hard work has gone into setting up a framework to accelerate progress over the next years, and I'm confident those scores will show a much greater improvement a year from now. Keep up the good work, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Joseph. Joseph Boyle. I'm Joseph Boyle. I'm speaking on my own behalf. Since being seated, this board has established a new and welcome tradition of placing the spotlight first and foremost on the students of District 11, just as we saw earlier this evening. Week after week, this board has welcomed students to tout their accomplishments, demonstrate their learning, and shower praise on the very special teachers who have played vital roles in guiding them to their successes. Since this board established this new tradition, it's been fun and really encouraging to see the kids and the teachers they've chosen to honor filling the boardroom to capacity and overflowing into the hallway, awaiting their chance to take center stage. But there are other people packing the boardroom each week and waiting in the hallway. They are the ones to whom the young people whose accomplishments are being celebrated are so much more than merely students. They sit on the edges of their seats, if there's one available for them, and crane their necks from all corners of the room to get a prideful glimpse of that special kid who they, and only they, know better than anyone else possibly can, and who they, and only they, care more for than anyone else possibly can. And those people will remember that prideful moment 20 and 30 and 50 years down the line because the kid they came to support is their own child and they, the parents, are their child's lifelong advocates. Many, if not most teachers and staff are of course parents themselves and understand as well or better than anyone the unique and irreplaceable bond between parent and child. No matter how many very special kids a teacher has had the honor and privilege to help guide along their educational path, there can never be a longer lasting bond or more important responsibility than a parent's bond with and responsibility to his or her own child. It's simply a matter of human nature. That's why it's entirely fitting, especially in these times of previously unimagined challenges, pressures, and strains being placed on parents, from the invasive and corrosive influences of social media to the rapidly rising cost of supporting a family, among other factors, that the board acknowledge and place into policy its recognition of and the, the unique irreplaceable and indispensable role of the parent in the lives and education of their children. And that the board further place into policy the district's commitment to be partners with the parents who entrust the education of their children to the district in establishing the best educational pathway for each and every parent's child. Thank you to this board for that recognition and commitment as set forth in policy AKB. Thank you for your work. Ms. Stacy Adair. Good evening. Uh, show me the money, follow the money. From all the president's men to Jerry Maguire, these quotes have made watchdogs out of all of us. I'm currently watching the drama surrounding the teacher pay negotiations. What does interest-based bargaining mean anyway? I would think that it is bargaining with both parties' interests in mind. The two parties in D11 would be one, the taxpayer-funded school district, and two, the teachers employed by the school district. The district is obligated to work for the good of the taxpayer and the students. The teachers' union is said to represent all teachers, even though close to 1,000 of our 2,000 teachers choose not to be in the union. In the ongoing negotiations, I can't help but wonder how the teachers union is working for the good of the teachers. In the same way they protected all the Mitchell staff who were fired with the uh, no union intervention, including everyone from the lunch ladies to the Spanish speaking principal in AP, 
In the same way, they agreed for elementary teachers to work an extra half hour but not get paid for it because the union wanted to share the elementary teacher's raise with middle and high school. Recently, the union let it be known that the district was proposing pay for performance. Just one small problem. This was absolutely untrue, otherwise known as a lie. Good thing, too, because I'm against pay for performance. You can't pay me for students' performance when I am given a curriculum that doesn't match the needs of my students. Yet, the teachers' union let that rumor fly without correcting it. I have to wonder why. I finally got a hold of the so-called pay for performance proposal. Guess what? Shocker, it wasn't pay for performance. It was a graduated pay scale that paid teachers more for taking on more responsibility. I kind of liked it. If I take on more responsibility, then I can get paid more. As teachers, we already do so many of these things without getting paid for it, it sounded great to me. It was disturbing how these unchecked rumors spread like wildfire, all the way to a school that decided to stage a no-show day in solidarity. This just happens to be the teachers' union president's school. Must be a coincidence. Who created this scenario? Who benefits from this scenario? The district? No, but nobody cares. The parents who must make arrangements when a school doesn't open and the students who miss out on learning. The teachers who are afraid that they will be unfairly paid based on the decisions outside of their control. I didn't see anyone trying to straighten out the misinformation. So who benefits from fear in D11? Do more teachers join the union when they are afraid they will be judged unfairly? Do more teachers join the union when they feel that the superintendent is against them? Do more teachers join the union when they feel that the board doesn't care about them? Teachers' union membership has been declining across the country since it was revealed that the teachers' union used their influence to keep school districts closed across the country during COVID. Could this misinformation and fear-mongering be a part of a plan to increase union me membership? Well, the next time I hear a rumor, I'll resist falling captive to it. We would all do better to resist manipulation that ends up hurting students, families, and teachers. Thank you. Your time is up. Joel Sorensen, Mr. Joel Sorensen. Mr. Joel Sorensen, okay, I don't see him. Ms. Darcy Shoning, Darcy Shoning, okay. Mr. Josh Hustler. Good evening, board. It's good seeing you again, especially at the end of the school year. Uh, I'm here actually to thank you for the thankless job that each of you have volunteered and, and searched for. Each of you reached out in the past, and I greatly appreciate directors, treasurer, vice president, president, and superintendent for the past challenges that I have faced with my child who is in fourth grade. I'm here because of him and the other three children of mine. You have put our children first. This new school board and superintendent have put my son and his education first for the first time since the last administration. New policies involve the parents and their children's education for transparency and honesty, which is new in District 11, and I thank you. I do not understand the agenda that many other school boards and the teachers union or association, but by any other name, around Colorado have been pushing to keep information and their children from their parents. This seems common sense. Just a few years ago, I would not have to be here because it would be known that parents are the parents and the schools are to teach, not parent. That's my job. Unfortunately, many parents can't be here tonight due to work, other obligations to their family, and their own home life. But I am here to thank you because of so many parents that we've talked to have said they were very concerned about District 11 until you took your places now in these positions. Again, I want to thank you. I know it's thankless. I want to appreciate everyone for reaching out to me during the challenges with my son and his school. And uh, I'm seeing a very bright future in District 11 because of each and every one of you, and I thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. 
Miss Hannah Martin. Good evening, my name is Hannah Martin, she, her, Aya, and tonight I am speaking as a D11 parent. Teachers, I hope you know how appreciated you are and how worthy you are of so much more than you are paid and treated. In honor of Teacher Appreciation Week, I rewrote Gall's email that he sent to the community last Thursday. It should have read, Dear Doherty families, we regret to inform you that we must cancel school for students today due to high levels of teachers taking a teacher leave day. You or your student may hear from teachers why they choose to take today off related to various initiatives that were assumed to increase student achievement. I am making decisions that directly affect your teacher's pay, but I'm doing it at a time that forces them to make a hard decision. Teachers should not have to choose between advocating for themselves and families and teaching students. It is my job to make sure that they can do both in a just way. Yet, sadly, I am making conscious decisions that impact our first and most critical obligation to be sure to provide support and a living wage so teachers can, in turn, provide an excellent education. Instead, my district sends emails encouraging them to use food banks. I say we value all teachers, but then I don't follow through by listening to those who are putting in the work and are the reason we have students at all. I tell the educators we can't pay them a living wage because our enrollment is dropping, but then tell all of you, my D11 community, that enrollment is growing and I've fixed the problem. I have brought changes to the table that tell teachers they are not worthy and they can only make a living wage if they over do overtime as if they aren't already doing it. I now understand that this doesn't provide collaboration. It will not help students because all of our exemplary teachers will have to leave to find different jobs that will not cap their pay so they can afford their mortgages and groceries. I also realize that I am capping two thirds of our teachers at 55,000 a year when I make 220,000 a year. That means I can make a teacher's annual salary in only two and a half months. This is the kind of noise I brought to the table and I have unfortunately been louder than the ones this directly affects. Our obligation to you as taxpayers is to provide the highest quality education for our students. This is our commitment to your family. To those families in the community that have members with disabilities or need handicapped parking, I parked illegally in your space both times the district met to bargain teacher salaries. I told the teachers this and I will tell you too. I have no excuse to park there, but instead of parking legally, I can make it better by donating $375 to an organization that supports accessibility. As you can see, I value all of our staff in the same shared vision. I may be above the law, I may refuse to move or change, and I could pay my way out of it. You as the D11 community deserve better. Thank you for your continued patience as I work toward listening and understanding that the best interest of our students is not reducing teacher pay or making teachers leave. It is not parking unapologetically in handicapped spaces. It is not flaunting my disposable income while I steal your teacher's income, but doing better. I will do better. Respectfully, Michael Gall, Superintendent, Colorado Springs, District 11. Michelle Warwick. Good evening, board members. Um, my name is Michelle Warwick, and I am a parent of uh, soon to be three children at Adams Elementary. Um, I am here to talk about the parent partnership. I would first like to say thank you for uh, making this policy possible. This policy um, is very good for parents and there are a few things that I'd like to highlight from it. The board and district seek to collaborate and communicate with parents and continuously improve education quality for, stu for and student experiences. I think that the public education experience for kids is, um, there's nothing that you can compare it to. And I too like to uh, contribute my time to helping in make that quality or the education quality and student experience better. Um, I'd also like to highlight the, the board and district seek to treat every parent and child with dignity, honor, and respect. Um, just as we would treat other human beings with dignity, honor, and respect. That's like kind of a no brainer to me. Um, the provide parents with access to complete unbiased and clear information about their children and our schools. Um, I like the fact that they highlighted the word unbiased in this in this uh, statement, and then involve parents in decisions regarding overall well-being and health care of their child. These things sh seem like they shouldn't have to be written on paper. That this should be something that should already have been being done. And then it also highlights the um, the board and district encourages parents to. 
Um, instruct their children to follow the established classroom behavior expectations to help create a positive learning environment. Again, that seems like a no-brainer. You should always promote your children or instruct your children to have positive behavior wherever they are. And then communicate routinely with their child and their child's teacher. I don't know why this has to be in writing, but um, parents should already be doing these things. And I just wanted to say thank you for putting this on paper, even though I feel like it shouldn't have to be on paper. Ms. Rebecca Kelty. Hello, board. My name is Rebecca Kelty. I'm a D11 resident with a parent's heart. As the school year comes to an end, I want to thank you, uh, Superintendent Gall, and the board for many accomplishments that you have completed. Uh, to name a few, adding new schools like charter schools into D11, ensuring its growth and positive options for all students, um, I thank you for that. Educational options and choices help our kids flourish, it's all about kids, and you make it so. Working towards education, education excellence by demanding important graduation classes like economics and biology. These types of classes help students now and set some up for later, for success, for decades to come. Foundational classes are a must, it's just common sense. You tremendously upgraded teachers' health insurance, which will last many years. It's better and less expensive than 99% of most regular insurances that I've seen. Even many re retired reti veterans pay four times more for their health insurance than the teachers do. Teachers now have massage and acupuncture options, all while saving taxpayers money. It's a win-win, and thank you for that. They can't complain. Listening to parents and allowing them to have a voice is very important. It's their children they speak for and want to protect. And you guys, you never forget that. Most importantly, active, actively sharing, all of you actively sharing in the success of our amazing students and their great achievements by your school visitations and wonderful presentations here. With this said, there are many things that we must work on in D11 going forward. A couple top items that many parents desperately want to see done. One of them, like many school libraries across America, we must clean up our school libraries of all inappropriate and technically illegal books. The last thing we need is porn, hard drug use promotion, and other immoral literatures in our school and classroom libraries. They are, they are harmful to minors. They steal our children's innocence and enhance behavioral issues. Parents trust their kids trust that their kids are safe in a healthy environment in the schools. Let's make sure this gets done. As we reflect over the last year, removing rogue woke clubs, teachers, woke teachers, and woke counselors from D11 is a must, more now than ever. Those not willing to follow the core teacher teaching curriculum, those refusing to protect children's innocence against woke agendas, and those refusing to listen to what parents want for their children, they must go. Activists, they are activists first who teach second and they have no place in our schools. We are the parents making our stand and we are willing to fight. Our kids' lives depend on it. But with that going forward, I do want to thank you again for your hard work and selfless dedication. You are the bee's thank knees. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to the end of public comments. Thank you all for being here, sharing your thoughts and comments. All of us on the board appreciates hearing from you. Your feedback helps us better do our work. If you checked the box asking a district admin to contact you, someone from administration will follow up. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, it's board member reports and board members who wants to go first. Or is there anybody that wants to go with the board member report? Director Daniels. Thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge the Crystal Apple Award recipients from, I believe it was uh, Monday night, May 8th. Um, congratulations to all of you all across the district who received 
those acknowledgements. And of course, the committee who put it together, thank you again for that. And uh, it was wonderful to see so many teachers get acknowledged. And I also wanted to acknowledge our class of 2023. Congratulations on completing 12, 13 years of high school and preparing for a new chapter in your life. It's exciting to see. I'm also looking forward to the graduations and seeing all of your smiling faces out there, just knowing that you accomplished a big, landmark in your life and getting ready for many more to come. Um, please take care of yourselves and each other. And uh, don't forget, <laughs> you've been through a lot for the last four, three, four years, and OMG, you got through. So I just wanted to acknowledge you and say thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Director Jenkins. <clears throat> Sorry, a couple things to report on. I brought my Letterman's jacket tonight, uh, 2003 graduate from Doherty High School, and so just got to dry clean. I don't have my pins back on it, but uh, since we were celebrating seniors and graduations, I figured I would dust it off and pull, pull it out of the closet and bring it tonight uh, just to celebrate with our Doherty alumni who are uh, past and present and those that are graduating. So um, finished up work with the Highly Effective Evaluation Subcommittee, which is part of the Personnel Advisory Committee that uh, I've been asked to be a part of. And so we spent four meetings uh, last Monday, Tuesday, and then this Monday, Tuesday, discussing what that highly effective evaluation process looks like. And so we are ready to now bring that forward back to the general PAC uh, committee or PAC team. So um, progress there, which is great. Also was able to sneak out uh, for two events last night, much to my wife's chagrin, leaving four kids at home, uh, but had a great time. Was able to visit the team that we recognized tonight from Palmer at the CR CIRT National, the ACE program. That was wonderful to see their work and to hear a little bit from each of them, more than you got to hear tonight. Um, so hearing from them about how they redesigned the Drake Power Plant since we're decommissioning it and what that looks like uh, and how they put their brains together and had a blank canvas that was uh, really remarkable. And then was able to hop over to Mitchell for, <coughs> excuse me, the unified basketball event where we got to see a uh, majority of the high school principals and their teams. And this was teams of uh, student mentors and students that had uh, special needs or, or disabilities. And they played each other in these short basketball matches and the first time I was able to attend uh, by our athletic director, Chris Knoll, sent the invite and was able to get over there. And to be able to see not the students sinking baskets, but to be able to see the parents of students with special needs cheering from the stands their, their students who they have never seen on the basketball court, um, moving down the court. And, and you know, one of uh, the gentlemen tonight, um, was it Logan uh, or Mitchell? shooting threes. I mean, uh, <laughs> you were there, Scott, last night. Uh, just remarkable. Just uh, a really good time celebrating students working together. So um, other than that, I think that's all I have. I've got a few other site visits scheduled before graduations, but we're getting things done. Thank you. Director Nelson. Well, first I want to start off by just thanking Mr. Golf for getting our board meetings um, kicked off with this focus being on students. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I think we should start every meeting with the singing. That was so beautiful and just so calming. <laughs> um, so I vote for that again. Uh, and I also wanted to just make mention of um, the, the night of the Mitchell community event. We had several invitations, and now looking back, I realize we should divide and conquer because I think like four of us board members went to Keller, and then I went on to Bristol, and I know other board members went to other schools as well uh, that night, just hitting up, hitting as many as we could. I had, I was going to try and do three, but my seven and nine year old were done after Bristol, so I dragged them along with me. But um, so I just wanted to speak a little about um, the work that we have been doing over this past spring last and and over this past year giving some context last year we as a board gave a historically high compensation package and on Monday during negotiations with representation for teachers the board proposed a total compensation compensation package of 13.77 percent this is three percent higher than the package last year we are paying for two more professional development days for our, next, for our staff next school year. 
We value our staff and want to invest in your careers. Despite being a declining enrollment district with serious risk of closing schools and having to cut staff, the board is aggressively budgeting to support our teachers, education support professionals, and executive professionals while working towards improving academic outcomes. We recently received a thank you note from a teacher for the new health benefits plan. In the fall, I asked the district to perform an RFP to make sure we were getting the highest quality benefits at the best price for our staff. And the board then directed admin to put out the request for a proposal. We had been with the previous provider for 19 years, and so it seemed con common sense that after such a long time without investigating other options, it would be wise to explore the market. We now have better benefits at a lower cost to our staff than we would have had if we had stayed with our provider. In addition to great coverage for individuals, District 11 provides the best family health insurance package compared to other districts in the region, covering 70% of the cost. You can't find this high coverage for families anywhere else in El Paso County. Every move this board has made has improved the employment of our staff. We are continuing to look at creative ways to improve District 11. The superintendent and board want to address the large number of vacancies. We are targeting pay raises to reach high need and those closest to the classroom. For example, we want to raise starting teacher pay by over $7,000, getting us to around $49,000, the second highest of school, um, school districts in the area. And negotiations are still taking place, so uh, we'll see where everything lands. I'll end with a story. The parking lot at my kids' school is often full, so I park in the neighborhood and walk over to pick up my kids every day. I pass the children headed to get on the big yellow school bus, and they always make me smile. But the other day, I found myself unable to smile. I couldn't help but think about the data presented at last week's work session, that 33% of kids are at grade level in English language arts, and only 20% in math. This means 80% of District 11 students are not where they need to be in math, and it's not much better in ELA. As I passed the kids, I looked at each one, studying their little faces, wondering, is it you? Are you struggling with school? How can we help you? I'm so sorry that you are not where you need to be, not prepared to head into the next school year. I ask myself, of the 10 I just walked by, which eight are behind? Which eight of the 10 sitting on that big yellow bus are we? And by we, I mean all of the adults involved. Which eight kids on that bus are we failing? Parents, if you are watching and are concerned about your child's achievement level, reach out to your teacher. We are providing summer school again this summer and dearly want to help catch kids up. And for your part, encourage your children to read while on break. And staff, I ask that as we review the parent partnership policy, you consider this as support to you and the hard work you are doing. While you do your best to deliver high quality instruction, adopting our best first instruction strategy, we want parents to come alongside, value their children's education, and support them at home. We are going to need all hands on deck, and we as a district must adopt an attitude of partnering with parents in the education of their children. It must be foundational in our operations and culture. Eight out of 10 kids need all of us working together to help turn our academic achievement levels around. We must put our focus on the students. Thank you. Thank you. Director Hawk. Thank you. Uh, just reflecting on many of the comments being made today from the dais and elsewhere. Um, happy Teacher Appreciation Week to those who celebrate. And um, I think the board is doing uh, much of what it can to improve compensation. So I'll, I'll note that. Um, teachers are certainly out and about just as much as us board members making things happen with um, our students and making extra events um, occur. I mean, even what we've seen up here this evening and uh, with the ACE thing that we enjoyed last, last night. Boy, it just seems like so long ago already. Um, 
So I'm just going to note a couple of those. We had Keller's Art Night, Twain celebrated its 60th anniversary. I managed to go to the resource night at Mitchell High School, but I was so late because of the other events that there was, wasn't much to see. Um, but I'm glad that, to know that um, from Velvet that we had such great turnout. Um, along these lines, let's see, Adams had an art night. Taylor also did recently, but I think I noticed it that last, last time. And of course, the Crystal Apple Notes of Recognition. Um, I also got an opportunity to visit Tesla, for which I will be doing a graduation speech and sit down with some of the students there. And they speak about um, the opportunities that Tesla offers them. And so those of you who are going to graduation, you might hear more about that at that time. And it was funny, too, to have the, to me, to see the singers today. I think um, Principal Darren Smith walked me through the auditorium while they were practicing yesterday. And I was asking if that was going to be a graduation song. And I, I can't remember his answer, but maybe it was because he was, they were going to be here tonight. And, um, and also see that Cougar's Cares Closet, which Brent Irvin was honored for. So just so much going on here in the district, so many positive things, and parents are engaged. Oh, speaking of which, tomorrow, of all of the things we can do, um, Grant Elementary is having their night of a thousand stars or some such, and Rogers Elementary is having an art night, and it, just, it does go on. Um, so many opportunities. Please take advantage of them and, and visit our <coughs> schools. And I do want to note, too, um, I know Director Jorgensen noted the election, um, the previous election. We do have the mayoral runoff, so please, everyone, remember to vote. If you live in Colorado Springs, go ahead and get those ballots in by May 16th, 7 p.m. Thanks. Thank you. And I know Director Bankers has some comments to make, too. So, Director Bankers, the floor is yours. Thank you. I would like to... Uh, mentioned to both um, staff, parents, and children that in these last few weeks, you've heard this phrase before, finish strong, and I want to reemphasize that as we listen to so many wonderful things that are happening at the end of the year. It will be my privilege and my honor to give the graduation speeches at Achieve Online in Bijou, and as many of you know, I am recovering from an accident. So, uh, Bijou and online, you will be my first adventure out, and I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you all for doing the work that you're doing and keeping a spirit that says, together we are better. Thank you. Thank you, Director Bankers. I hope your recovery is going well, and we're looking forward to you next week at the graduation uh, ceremonies. And Director Loma is joining us. I know he was traveling and had a uh, challenging afternoon and evening caught in a tornado warning. Is that it, Director Loma? Okay. Uh, we are under board member reports. Uh, do you have <coughs> any comments or thoughts that you want to share at this point? I know that you just joined us. Uh, it's moving from me for uh, on the fire. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to have you here for the board meeting. So thank you. Um, with that, I will uh, finish my um, board member reports and close the board member reports part of the conversation. Uh, so um, as part of uh, board members uh, visiting uh, our uh, respective schools that we were assigned, uh, this was one of the schools, uh, uh, the Roosevelt Charter. I want to highlight um, that this is one of our charter schools. This uh, charter school, um, it's my second visit out there. I was at a school event, um, a parent event in the evening, and uh, great school community out there. Uh, if you remember three or four years back, pre-COVID, the school approached the then board at that time uh, to approve a lease debt financing for capital improvement. The COVID uh, delayed some of the construction, but a new wing has been constructed out there. And uh, they have a br brand new playground out, uh, out there, too. Um, uh, the school has approximate capacity of 800 students. They have uh, capacity to admit more students in there. They are planning on, uh, if possible, in the next couple of years, um, uh, expanding to a middle school option in there, too. Uh, uh, all the classes that I attended, the students were engaged. Um, uh, 
the demographics of uh, the school community, it's about 70% Hispanic. So a lot of the students are English language learners and the additional support that these students get and thrive in the classroom. Uh, the students at the far right corner are taking a test, so they had those little dividers and uh, <laughs> highly engaged students. And I got to also watch some <laughs> of the students uh, uh, shoot off rockets in the, as part of their um, GT program out there. So this was uh, a wonderful opportunity for me to visit that school. Um, uh, and uh, uh, this was a school that also got the governor's uh, uh, award for improvement in math through the pandemic. Uh, so great learning going on in our charter school out there in Roosevelt Charter. So I want to give a shout out to that community out there. And as we talked about, uh, and it's highlighted in the board priorities behind me, the focus of this board is three, students, staff, and uh, our parents. Uh, uh, usually students come first, but I will start with our parents as this is National Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, I was there at the Crystal Apple Awards just a couple of uh, nights back. Uh, I got to uh, celebrate our teachers out there. These are uh, teachers that have exceptional uh, teaching and instruction in their classrooms. Ms. Acevedo was there with me up there, and uh, Superintendent Gall joined us too for uh, some time out there. Uh, and for the last two or three years, we haven't been able to come together as a community to celebrate these exceptional teachers because of um, pandemic challenges. So this was for the first time the, uh, we were able to come together. The families of the students were up there. The families of the teachers were up there. Some of the students were up there. And our Doherty Pro Start students uh, prepared the food uh, for the teachers. Um, just an amazing event. And I want to thank our Crystal Apple Award uh, committee too, uh, just to see the joy in our teacher's face out there, just for a simple recognition for an amazing job that they've done throughout the year. Uh, um, uh, my dear friend, Donny Thomason was recognized at the bottom right, and uh, uh, it was good to see uh, some amazing teachers get uh, uh, recognized that, day, uh, that night out there. So celebrate all our teachers. Ha uh, our teachers do an exceptional job. We as a school board, prioritize teachers, that's why we have staff investment as one of our board priorities up there. Celebrate our teachers, we honor our parents. And I was at the Doherty Pinning Ceremony, which is uh, a time when uh, seniors who graduated, who are scheduled to graduate in the next couple of weeks, they walked their parents or guardians or people that have made a significant, significant difference in their lives onto the stage and watching these students share words about their mother or father or grandparent who's made a significant difference in their life, honoring them for the 12, 13 years of uh, K-12 education and getting them to where they, the, where they are. Uh, um, there were several people that uh, had teary eyes listening to what our students shared about the important role parents play in their lives. Um, uh, lots of proud families out there. You can see the emotions even in some of the pictures that I'm sharing with you. And data shows over and over again that parental engagement is critical for continued student success. And that's a testament for the differences parents make in our school. Uh, so today we have a parental partnership policy that we'll be discussing, and that was mentioned by some of our uh, public comments. It is our promise to parents that parents are an in uh, integral part and recognize that parents are an integral part of their students' education. In District 11, parents have a voice. And usually students come first, but I want to, uh, this time around, after parents, we have our students. So we were at uh, North uh, um, uh, Middle School, right uh, across the street from here to um, celebrate our students out there. And these students went through several weeks of uh, state testing, other testing, that uh, internal testing that they had to do. So the school had an all-star assembly to recognize the work, the all-star student assembly to recognize the work that these students did. Um, sharing a lunch with those students, uh, Director Nelson was there with me and um, uh, watching these uh, students play some games and uh, uh, end the school week after 
after a rigorous week of testing, it was a Friday afternoon, uh, coming together as a school community, and um, uh, each of these students also had uh, the in and out burger truck out there, so um, uh, it was great to support our students who have worked uh, tremendously hard over the last uh, year. Um, we also got to visit Miss um, Connie Rogers out there. She is the community liaison. And uh, we got to see all the um, uh, support and resources that are available for our students out there. Some of our students come from challenging backgrounds. And these students, if they need food or a backpack or a supplies or uh, even clothes, we have excellent community liaisons in several of our schools. I think a student right out here shared about uh, the Coronado market and uh, the Coronado corner, corner market that makes a difference. So there are incredible supports, incredible work being done by our staff out there. So I want to recognize uh, our, uh, students, uh, uh, our students and the support staff that are supporting our students out there. So students, staff, and parents. All three of those are highlighted in the board priorities out there. I want to congratulate um, yeah, Luther, uh, Luther Dempsey. Uh, Luther has been a constant presence here for the last six or seven years that I've been involved uh, in board meetings. Uh, usually I'm here pretty late in the nights. So I'm here till nine or 10 or 11 sometimes in the night. And Luther always uh, greets me with a smile on his face uh, and talks, uh, talks with me for 10, 15 minutes. Yesterday I was here working by myself till about 10 o'clock out here. I walk out, who I see, it's Luther. Uh, we got to talk for 15 minutes. And during that conversation, R Luther said that he is retiring at the end of this year. So I will miss you, my friend. I will miss our conversation, late night conversations, but I'm happy for you. 22 years of service in District 11. And you are um, just, there are so many other retirees out there. And so best wishes to all our retirees, best wishes to you, Luther. I want to give you a round of applause. <laughs> well, you, do you want to say something? OK, thank you. As a kid, I went to school District 11, a lot of schools, and I've got a lot of good memories doing that. Got a lot of good memories, too, working for the 22 years I have down here on the complex. Also want to thank each and every one of you board members for all the hard work you do. So thank you so much for the recognition. Thank have you. Good night. And I'll end with this. Uh, congratulations to all our graduates, class of 2023. You guys have worked really hard, four years of uh, uh, hard work. Um, as I said right at the very beginning, uh, that you entered high school and your freshman year was cut short with the COVID pandemic. And here you are. And I'm looking forward to greeting every one of you in the uh, graduation ceremonies in the next couple of weeks as you walk across that stage and celebrate with your friends and families. So thank you for uh, all our graduates. And um, uh, the last thing that I will say quickly, I want to let all of you know our staff are, uh, are appreciated. Um, I know that, that there are some challenging conversations that are going on. Uh, uh, and part of it is we have a fiduciary responsibility as an elected board to ensure that the, any budget investment that we make is balanced with the overall fiscal financial health of the district. Enrollment, it's a stark reality. Enrollment in District 11 has dropped by close to 5,000 students over the last five years, approximately about 4,700 students. And that is a 40 to $45 million less revenue that is coming in into our budget. And so we need to balance that with the overall fiscal health of the district. As uh, Director Nelson was sharing uh, uh, another year uh, of student enrollment loss, uh, we are facing some challenging decisions as a school board a year from now. Uh, it's a completely different conversation at that time, and it's going to be probably having to consider uh, closing schools or uh, uh, some of the most challenging conversations we can ever have as a board member. And I'm not looking forward to that if I'm still on the board at that time. Um, um, and some, on the, some in the community may say that that is the in inevitable way to go, that we may have to consider closing schools. For me, whenever we close a school, when you 
turn off the lights in that school building, you are turning off hope and opportunity in that neighborhood. And that's not a conversation we want to have. So when we go through conversations about the budget <coughs> over the next two, three, four weeks, and the board formally approves that budget, it is with all these challenging decisions that each board member has. And this is something that rests with us even when we go to bed. Okay, I, I know that there are several board members that wake up at three, four in the morning, I see emails coming from them at that time. It keeps us up at night. How do we ensure that our staff get, are appreciated and get a competitive compensation, that we celebrate them for what, what we did while also balancing not having to cut programs or close schools or um, um, cut our staff too if that is the path that we have to take a year from now. So we are aggressively investing right now in schools. This year, we added, in spite of all the budget challenges that we, pay, we, we faced, we added more teachers to our budget. We added more SPED staff to our budget. When all is said and done, we will, it'll be transparent to the community that District 11 is going to offer one of the highest compensation packages compared to any other school district in El Paso County or the state of Colorado. So as we go through these next process, next few weeks, all I ask from you is some grace and understanding. All of us are wrestling with some of these challenges and I know that we will land in a space where our staff will be appreciated. Thank you. With that, moving on. Um, adoption of consent items. Director Daniels, can you please make the motion to adopt the consent items? Yes, I move that the Board of Education adopt all consent items as designated in the agenda. The consent items are E2, approval of April 26, 2023, regular meeting minutes. E3, approval of personnel recommendations, May 10th, 2023. E4, adoption of revised policy JLCD, administering medicines to students. E5, adoption of policy JLCDC, medically necessary treatment in school setting. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Melissa, roll call, please. Director Bankus? Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Jorgensen? Aye. Director Loma? Aye. Director Malpacum? Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Bob? <coughs> Aye. The ayes have it. Uh, the consent items have been approved by the board. Uh, moving on to the action item, Director Jorgensen, can you please make the motion for action item F2? Yes, I move that the Board of Education approves the general fund contingency transfer for transportation's deficit in accordance with policy DBJ. Second. Moved and seconded. This is new information that's coming in front of the board. Superintendent Gall, I'm going to turn it over to you and your team. Yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Chris, Terry, and CJ, but as they come forward to the podium, I want to make the public acknowledgement for the incredible work that transportation has done this year with an insane limitation to resources, uh, particularly in the number of drivers that we've had in order to support what we just call student movement. Uh, many of our students uh, move across town by choice, but a lot of our students live with just outside of that walking area in their boundary school that require many, many routes to be supported. Uh, field trips, extracurricular sports, everything that happens in our district happens on the back of transportation from the morning to the evening and uh, oftentimes on the weekends. And so as you can expect in this year of incredible limitation of bus drivers, of which District 11 is not the only district suffering, uh, this is a nationwide pandemic, we, had, uh, we have a need to ask for some contingency um, dollars to be uh, moved to cover those costs. Um, but as you'll hear from Chris, <coughs> they're not outside of the original budget of which transportation started. They're just different ways that we had to provide those services. Chris. Thank you, Superintendent Gall. Good evening, Board of Education. Before I introduce the staff, I, the superintendent pretty much stated um, what I was going to identify, but I'm going to try and add a few things without being too repetitive. 
Um, I do want to shout out to the Transportation Department. This last year, they have had to demonstrate an all-hands-on-deck model to get students to and from schools. And they are also implementing a new strategy or new strategies to try and right-size ridership to become a more efficient transportation department. They have a plan next year that they'll be implementing and they are attriting shortages to reinvest in staff through a restructure that'll go into effect next year. Um, these particular uh, budget transfers do cover uh, issues that each item is going to be covered by Mr. Seaman, but it is important to note that we have fuel cost increases, we have um, outsourcing needs that we need to support our highest needs. Our McKinney Vento students are unfunded mandates, and a large portion of the contracted transportation fund balance request is to support those initiatives. So at this time, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Seaman. I would like to acknowledge that if there's any questions for McKinney Vento, we do have folks in the audience that could address any of those specific questions. Melissa is. Uh, good evening, board. As you know, I'm Terry Seaman, your Executive Director for Facilities Ops and Transportation. Uh, tonight, we're coming before you asking for $590,000 to shore up the transportation budget. So I've put together a few slides to go over that in detail because, you know, it is not a paltry sum. <coughs> and we're coming for bringing all of these um, forward uh, to you in a very transparent manner. Um, with me tonight is C.J. McCampbell. He is our uh, Director of Transportation, and he'll handle the in-depth questions that, uh, it's just so I don't misspeak for you. So the first uh, slide up here is um, where we're at in terms, oh, wait, that's the second slide. Let me go back to the first slide. So last year, our, our total budget, salary, and um, every, all the transportation activities totaled $5.8 million. Of that, uh, this year, um, primarily due to the compensation increases last year. It rose to 7.3 million. Of that, we've already expended 4.8 million this year, and we have another $86,000 in encumbrances. When you look at the available budget, you say, oh, there's no problem in transportation. Well, most of that is lap salaries. <coughs> year to date, we have only spent about 50% of our bus driver salaries and benefits. We should be at 83.3%. If you consider that uh, two months of salaries for the bus drivers is approximately $377,000, we, <coughs> we have a substantial amount of money left that you all had appropriated for transportation. Here are our transportation uh, continuous transfer requests. You'll notice that most of those could have fit under the superintendent's um, auspices to make the transfer for those specific budget line items, but because we wanted to be completely transparent to you, we're bringing them in their totality. And I don't know why it keeps going forward. <laughs> Let me put it down. Okay. Um, I'm going to handle these in, in three different buckets to make it a little bit, break it down and make it a little bit simpler. And I would suggest, uh, President Mel Packham, if there's any uh, specific questions, we can handle them in the three buckets. Uh, to make it a little bit uh, more efficient. Okay. So the, the, the first two buckets up there, or the first bucket up there is workman's comp and cl uh, insurance claim expense. These are sunk costs that, we're, we're, um, that we have every year. The challenge that we had is through an administrative oversight, we failed to increase the, the budget on these in the last two years. So we, are, we were budgeted old numbers, and these numbers have been steadily increasing over time. So this, for workman's comp um, and claim insurance, it's about a total of $75,000 that we're short. Next year, at the same budget re level, it, it will add another $30,000 to that. So these are expenses that we have. It was administrative oversight that we failed uh, to get them in the budget. We have corrected that, and in next year's budget, you'll see a total for these two line items 
um, of $306,000. We've already worked that through um, fiscal services. President McPuckham, are there any question on these two? Vote. Seeing none. Okay. The next three. Yes, uh, I have a question. Oh. Okay, Director Bankers. Uh, in looking at this um, uh, inaccurate budget over the last two years, what's been put in place so that that doesn't continue to happen? We've worked with um, the risk management um, office who gives us our insurance claim numbers to try to get those out sooner, and we got them in time to get them into next year's budget. Yeah, Director Bankus, I'll, I'll answer that. Uh, this year, uh, Executive Cabinet came and presented uh, their individual budgets and changes that would need by chief. And so I think what's happening is we're asking chiefs to be a little closer to their numbers instead of having it exist just in the shop and wondering if our fiscal team is identifying some of those deltas. And so as uh, Director Seaman, Executive Director Seaman communicated, we've identified that delta and made that correction into next year's budget. And so of the PBDA numbers that the board has seen, that correction has already been made. I appreciate that. I think that we owe it to the transparency of uh, what we're trying to accomplish in running our district, that that accountability is placed on someone's shoulders so that it doesn't continue to happen. I appreciate the change. Go ahead. Okay, so moving on, our, our next bucket is three commodities, and what we've seen this year is a marked increase in, in the costs. Okay, two of them are fuel. Um, Non-student fuel is primarily unleaded. If you notice that we, we still have a few dollars in the bank, but given the amount of activities that primarily the support staff does um, in uh, um, May and June to start to get ready for next year, we're anticipating about a $21,000 shortage there. Uh, a good significant part of the fuel increase cost was because of the refinery issue up in uh, Commerce City that happened between Christmas and New Year's. If you remember those spikes, uh, a significant amount of Colorado fuel comes out of that refinery. It's in the 70, 80% range. And so when that refinery uh, went down, our, our costs spiked um, greatly. Um, so you can see that where we're at there on non-student fuel. On student fuel, which is mostly diesel, is where we took the hardest hit. Um, right now, we've overdrawn the, the account by $56,000 to keep our buses on the road. If I was to stop buying fuel, uh, we may not uh, get past um, the end of school and have with fuel the fuel in our tank. So we've just kept uh, having our deliveries. We get a, a split delivery about every other week. Uh, the projected shortage right now to, to have our top tanks topped off um, in anticipation of next year um, because the prices are coming down is about $115,000. Um, our intent is to enter next year's uh, budget in with as much um, um, fidelity as we can because who knows what's gonna happen to fuel costs next year. It's, it's just a wild card. The um, third one in this bucket is vehicle maintenance. You know, we've, we've been before you and we've, we've uh, mentioned the supply chain issues that we've been having, um, and they've hit us hard, um, especially the prices of, of vehicle parts has hit us hard. Uh, you, uh, you combine that with um, um, you know, just expired inventory that we have to write off the books is why we've, we've got the deficit that we have today. But, you know, our, our vehicle fleet is as ready as it's ever been this time of year. So we are still able to transport students and safe buses. We just need this funding so we can keep our mechanics going through the summer so those buses will be as close to 100% mission capable as possible in the fall. That ends that budget. Okay. Any questions on fuel and vehicle maintenance? Go ahead. I know in years past we've budgeted for a couple of new yellow buses every year. With having the large number, larger number of yellow buses parked due to bus shortage, bus driver shortages, are we budgeting on less new yellow buses for next year to kind of bring some of this 
We, we have $600,000 out of the uh, capital reserve program that's budgeted every year for buses. At this point, uh, uh, CJ and I have discussed the need to just put a temporary pause on buying buses to see where our needs are. So if we need big buses, little buses, whatever kind of buses, it would give us an opportunity to buy the right buses. Great. But uh, we've paused temporarily the, the purchases at this point in time. Thank you for answering. Terry, I don't need a, a slide, but can you just describe um, what the change in fuel costs have been, particularly as you see the diesel number here? We ran a lot less routes than we normally would this year, but we're still so overspent. So what has been from a percent you know, of what we budgeted? And then how much, what is the, I guess the real question is, what's the price per gallon you're budgeting for next year? Uh, see, did you have the price per gallon that we're budgeting? I think we're budgeting around $3.50, somewhere in there. We were up over $4 when it spiked. So we're just not sure. So we don't want to go too low. And even though Please speak into the microphone. Buses, oh, I'm sorry. And even though we're going to run less buses next year, we still have to be prepared. And as Terry said, I cut back on bus purchases so I can re go through the fleet and see what our true needs are. Because we really might need the smaller buses based on what I'm seeing and more of the mid-size based on what I'm seeing. And as we look at reducing it to some degree, not enough to hurt us, but to some degree as we bounce back and as things change, we're able to pivot and spin on that. So that's where we so, are right now. So we'll now. make an obligation to the board that we'll do a quarterly review on fuel uh, starting in the first, which the first school quarter, which is the third quarter of um, of the fiscal year. So we'll do that starting the year. We'll do a quarterly review of fuel specifically, um, just to make sure that the 350 works, because we don't really know what the future holds when it comes to fuel costs. And like I said, those aren't exact numbers because I did not come with that. We were just kind of gauging where we were in our high points. And just to give you an idea, um, our if you look at the pump prices, diesel has ranged from um, in the mid $5 range, and now at certain stations on the retail side, it's in the 370s, 360s. So that's, uh, I haven't, you know, public math is always dangerous, but I think that's 30 or 40 percent, uh, uh, about a 30 percent swing in, in price. So it has been significant. Continue with the third bucket. Okay, here, this one is, is the, the big one. Um, we are short for the uh, contracted services that we're using to transport students to and from school. Uh, just to remind you where we're at at the start of the year with the bus driver shortage, we brought on some vendors to provide that we could provide uh, car service for those outlying students that we have, whether it was a McKinney Vento student or the student just lived in a neighborhood where there was no other students that were to be transported to the school. So we've relied on uh, two co different commercial carriers to provide that service for us, and it is pricey. There's no doubt about it. But I can tell you with one of those car services, we are averaging a <coughs> no-show rate that we're paying for that's in the five, six, seven percent range every week. Now that, that might sound like a lot, the national average for that same company is 15%. So we're half or less than half of the national average. Um, I think that remote um, just advances your slides. Yeah, and I wonder if these are on time. Um, so I'll just keep it in my hand and back it up as soon as it goes forward. Uh, so um, we have got a substantial amount of bills that are uh, pending. We get invoiced every week and uh, if you need the specific number, CJ can go through on um, how many we've rides we've already used and uh, we haven't paid for it. It's, it's at least $71,000 that are on purchase order requests out there. And we, by the nature of how these contracts are set up, not all the rides are on there. Um, we currently have a balance in the account, but we know that based on the rides that have already been uh, given but not invoiced or billed, we're all, we're, we are in actuality in the red. So we need somewhere in the neighborhood, 
of uh, $290,000 just to shore up the account. Now, the, 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 the uh, thing I, assurance that I can give you is if our re, um, actual expenditures fall short, this money will be swept at the end of the fiscal year and it will come back into the general fund. It will not be transferred to any other account and used for any other reason other than student transportation. So that is that is my presentation on that one. Are there any questions? Questions on that? Can, can you just touch for the community to understand about what percentage of that is uh, supporting McKinney-Vento and maybe um, someone briefly come and describe McKinney-Vento transportation needs to the community? Bridget, come on forward. Bridget Donovan, everyone, our director of McKinney-Vento. Yeah. So I'll let her speak more in detail, but basically the McKinney-Vento, by law, we have to transport. Now, Bridget Donovan and her team were doing it directly, which actually put the students on the bus on a service to get to school faster. Uh, and what I mean by faster, for us to get them on a yellow bus, it's about three days. They can call directly with one of the contractors and get them on the next day. That's better for the student. But it's costly, and they ran out of their funding, and she will explain that. When they run out of their funding, it goes back to transportation, and they're currently at a funding of $65,000 a month. I have two months to go, so of that 292, you're looking at about a hundred and, you know, two hundred and some thousand dollars that goes to them, 130,000 out of all of that. We were budgeted with our service contractors with Ever Driven, oh, probably about 60,000, 50,000, somewhere in there, 28. And then we got notified what was happening to McKinney Vento and we knew we had to cover it. And so that's why we came to the board and that's why that is where it is. I will let Bridget take over the rest in case you have detailed questions regarding McKinney Vento and what they go through. Hi, I'm Bridget Donovan and I'm the McKinney Vento specialist with the district. And so this school year we have, um, or my sole responsibility is um, making sure that the rights of um, students who are housing insecure um, are protected and one of those rights is transportation um, specifically to the school of origin and so what that means is you have a student who is in school at a specific in location and if they become housing insecure or homeless then they move across town they still have that right to go to school at the school that they attended initially and my approach, I, I'm a teacher, and I've been a teacher in District 11 for 17 years, and another 17 years prior to that in California. And um, my experience is always to limit some of those um, chaotic moments in kids' lives. If we can keep things stable for them in just one avenue, then they're gonna be in a better situation. And so that fully supports the idea of um, maintaining that, that school of origin um, experience so they have that community um, and that support system when sometimes that's the only thing in their lives that is consistent. And so that's a, some of that background that comes from, um, you know, um, providing that transportation. It is also a federal act, um, so every state is and every school district is in the same situation. Um, the bus driver shortage obviously is, has had a significant impact um, across the United States. Um, so using Hop, Skip, Drive and Ever Driven have been sort of a saving grace for some of our most vulnerable students and families. Um, I do manage um, um, the rides for 94 of our McKinney-Vento students. We currently have 361 identified. Um, I did provide a handout that I believe was emailed to each of you, given some details about kind of the work that we've done this year. Um, so of those 94 um, students who are in my hop, skip, drive account, um, those I have direct contact with parents. Um, like if they move, some of our families move every other day. So they can contact me 
and I can change the address in the system so we can get them to school um, and things like that. So it's been, I, I believe it's been a help, um, my understanding from transportation to some extent to be able to provide um, that service for kids in addition to all the other responsibilities of um, being McKinney Vento specialist. Um, but that's a little bit about what or where this kind of has come from. Um, moving forward, um, I'm not 100% sure um, what transportation is going to look like. As far as bus drivers and bus routes for the next school year, um, I would anticipate um, needing um, these altern alternate uh, companies to help support the students in our district so that we can continue to get them to school and provide success and education so that they can have more options and opportunities in their future. Any questions for, oh, you did, Director Nelson. I was just curious, have we seen a like growth in the need for this and is that why you were budgeted 65,000 and we've already blown through that? Has, has our need, have our needs grown? They have. Um, in the beginning of the school year, we had identified about 290 students, and I think, you know, a lot of them in the in the beginning are kind of within our arm's reach. And then, as time goes on and they move around, um, we, you know, in order to get them to school, we have to look at different um, sorts of um, options. Currently, I mean, I'd say our growth in identifying McKinney Vento is. Um, there's probably a hundred more that have been identified since the beginning of the school year. You know, we have some drop off and then we've added um, more. Um, there's a lot of systemic and societal things that are happening in our community with cost of living um, that are impacting the families that we serve. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you combine all of that, it really um, sort of fuels the, the need for um, you know more services for them and remind me um, is this a unfunded or that 65,000 a month is that is there a source for that or is that coming from the district's budget so I had there was a grant initially it was an ARP HCY grant um, which is was based on COVID you know um, relief funds mm -hmm. and so we had some of that to cover some of the costs at the beginning of the year and then we had Title I set-asides that were spent on an ongoing basis because the companies need to get paid either weekly or monthly. And then we're at that point where all of that funding is exhausted. And so, um, you know, having transportation pay for. Sure. So going forward, this is, you already are building our budget next year to account for these needs since we won't have that COVID money or possibly the grant again. Is that already factored in for yeah. our budget needs next year? That's part of what we're working on. So. Okay. Yeah. Good. But the need will for sure be there. Yeah, unfortunately. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just any other questions? Yes. Director Bankers. Yes, I um, wanted to ask if the 5 to 6% no-show rate on our contracted transportation includes uh, the children that you um, that are in this program as well. Oh. Because if that's true, that's really a good, um, a good response to the services that we're offering. So uh, some of the five percent are McKinney Vento students, I would imagine. If if we were to break out McKinney Vento separate, the rate is a little bit higher. It's closer to the national average. Um, mm -hmm. But when you think about these students and the fact that they might be moving every other day. Being at the national average for um, one of the companies on their no-show rate is, is tremendously um, successful because these are students that are hard to track. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, I agree. Uh, yes. so I, I just commend Bridget for the work that she's doing to keep it close to their national average. Um, we're doing the same thing, but, but that's general ed students that are easier to track because they're, they're stable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Looks like you had a few more slides to go through. Is that uh, it? Those were oh, just those backups. Are... Okay. Just in case I needed them. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the board? Thank 
Director Art. Thank you. I'm just curious about, essentially, sort of like the no-show, um, but no, not. How do we improve our own turnaround time or awareness, if, or is it even an issue of a student can't attend on some given day? Is, can you just give us a quick brief on that? If I'm a parent, I call, do I call someone to say my, my student won't make the bus, or how long does that person wait? How do we know? So the, the way the, um, the program works is um, it's based on cancellation time. So if a student wakes up sick in the morning and can't make it to school, we have to pay the full rate. If they call eight hours ahead of time, then it would be a partial rate and more than the, I think if it's more than the eight hours, then we do not pay any, anything. So we actively manage that. Our, our field trip coordinator is the, the one actually making the calls to the students to find out, uh, or the families, why they didn't show up so that we can manage that um, and keep that rate low, as low as possible. Thank you. Seeing no further, seeing no further comments or questions, thank you. So the motion on the table is to approve the general fund contingency, contingency <coughs> tra transfer for transportation's deficit in accordance with policy DPJ. The motion was made, it was seconded. Roll call, please. Director Bankus? Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Jorgensen? Aye. Director Loma? Aye. Aye. Director Malpacum? Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Ott? Aye. The ayes have it, the budget transfer was a general fund contingency transfer was approved. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. The next item is an FTE approval. Director Loma, can you please make the motion for action item F3? Thank you. I move that the Board of Education approves the request for 1.0 FTE for a chief financial officer position. Second. Moved and seconded. Again, this is new information, Superintendent so Call. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, yeah, the Board of Education has expressed interest in the district hiring a CFO, and this is the FTE to give us the authority to do that. Well, that was so short and sweet. <laughs> uh, I know that um, the DAC had also made that recommendation. Uh, in their uh, DAC budget also made the recommendations in some of the conversations that we've had on the board dais and um, <laughs> so this is the uh, approval that is there in front of the board uh, for approving this chief financial officer position and um, uh, we have a chief operations officer right now. Super. Right now, we have an interim chief operating officer position of which Chris Odom is filling. And so then this would be a CFO to complement the COO as the structure going forward. Okay. Thank you. Further questions? Director Nelson. It's just more a comment and to give a little background that um, previously the district for the last like 30 years, how long was Glenn in his position? Um, had an employee that fulfilled sort of both roles, the chief financial officer and a chief operations officer. And we have had um, that position posted for applicants to apply for quite a while. He's been retired for quite a while. We had someone in for a short period of time and the workload was a, a great, um, great amount to deal with. So we're just realizing that someone who's been in the district for 30 year, years could take on all of the um, responsibilities and put in a lot of hours to make it work. But at this point in time, the district is, um, we don't have that, that uh, capacity anymore. And so we're, we have identified a need to separate the roles so that um, we can fulfill the position according to the, the needs that we are seeing. And um, it's a little different when you have someone in a position for 30 years and then bringing someone else new in. So that's partly the background on why we are um, moving this forward for approval. 
Thank you. And I think Director Nelson is talking about somebody that uh, is quite familiar in district circles. It's uh, Glenn Gustafson, and Glenn could wear multiple hats in the district, and he had the capacity to um, uh, take on that uh, uh, rules and responsibilities. And we tried that option, I think, a couple of years back with uh, uh, an employee who had uh, the same role as Glenn had, uh, replacing Glenn. And uh, he, after three or four months, uh, said that this is uh, too much burden on his health. And he decided to part ways with us in the middle of the school year. Uh, so we've tried that option, finding the next Glenn, but those are big shoes to fill. Uh, <coughs> Director Loma. Well, um, you know, when you, um, when you need a position, it normally, um, comes from whoever in charge that needs a position, that need a field. Um, um, I've been hearing nothing but complaints from uh, our employees that the administration is too top heavy. And well, it's gonna get a little heavier if we get a CFO. Um, so that's just counter to what, what um, we've been talking about in the past, that there's a lot of dead weight, a lot of waste, a lot of unneeded, expenditures um, so if 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 the superintendent feels he needs a CFO then okay but if if it's just because you want to fill a position because we had it before uh, I think that's kind of a dumb reason um, so um, I would have to uh, find out really yeah. it, it, I'd know. like to just add a little more context and so in the sketch out of how we do this we don't think it would cost the district the entirety of that salary to add the position there are some restructure options on the table for us to get more specific on operators operating and financers financing um, it was an incredible stretch for uh, uh, Mr. Gustafson, who I never had the opportunity to actually work directly with or for, to manage the entirety of the system on his side. I will say that my observation, with no ill regard to any decisions that were made before, is some of the opportunities that Chief Odom has been able to display on many restructures in the op side has said that we spent a lot more time watching the finance side of the house than we did on the op side of the house. And so having 110 FTE positions for bus drivers, and it's been many years since we've had all 110 filled, and some of the challenges we've had with building managers and building techs, means that the district needs to have the areas of focus covered by this position. Again, I think through some of the restructures that we've done, we're able to do this without this being felt from a budgetary perspective as an additional administrator. Okay. Director Art. Thank you. So just to confirm, you're, hire, you're looking to hire July 1st effectively or before that? Uh, the start date would start July 1st. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? OK, seeing none, uh, Melissa, roll call, please. Director Bankus. Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Jorgensen? Aye. Director Loma? Aye. Director Malpacum? Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Ott? Aye. The ayes have it. So um, uh, this uh, request has been approved, the FTE approval. Moving on to the next item, this is the instructional materials and secondary courses approval. Uh, Director Nelson, can you please make the action, make the motion for action item F4? I move that the Board of Education approve the instructional materials and new or amended courses as submitted. Second. <coughs> Moved and seconded. This information was presented to the board as non-action <coughs> during the April 26th uh, board meeting. Uh, Director Gates and uh, her team, the uh, curriculum team, provided additional information as requested by some of the board members. Um, so um, hopefully that information provided some context and clarity and answered some of the questions. I'll open it up for discussion. Any further questions or thoughts? Director Jurgensen. 
Yeah, last um, board meeting I brought up two questions around the intro to research and the terror TRCSS. Uh, I was able to get that uh, information that I requested just recently and reviewed it and uh, it fulfilled my questions and gaps in understanding and so uh, Ian Schreiner, I will be voting yes for your TRCSS tonight. <laughs> well, <laughs> he's going to be happy. <laughs> Any further thoughts or comments? Yes. Oh, oh Director Bankus. Yes, I wanted to also um, highlight the introduction to science research. I think that um, it's even more to the to add to the accolades of our uh, regional science fair winners that they were able to complete and develop the projects that they were able to bring to fruition for their um, competition and move on to state, given the fact that we didn't have the introduction to science research already in place. And I also wanted to um, mention the Taros, and I got my, answer, my questions answered. Um, one of the things that I am extremely pleased to know about the terror program is that it gives our children the opportunity to explore different venues, and not venues, different uh, cultural opportunities outside of, um, outside of maybe what they've experienced within their neighborhood or within their uh, school community. So I applaud them. I applaud the teachers who put that together and uh, want to give them the recognition that they deserve for reaching out and codifying this opportunity for the students who participate in tears. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further comments or questions, roll call please, Melissa. Director Bankus. Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Jorgensen? Aye. Director Loma? Aye. Director Malpacum? Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Ott? Aye. The ayes have it. The motion, the motion for the instructional materials and secondary courses approval has been uh, adopted by the board. Moving on to the next item, this is uh, a resolution for Mental Health Awareness Month. Director Art, can you please read the resolution and make the motion for action item F5? Yes, resolution 2023-33, National Mental Health Awareness <coughs> Month, May 2023. Whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health, and whereas mental health conditions can have a substantial effect on all areas of life, such as school or work performance, relationships with family and friends, and ability to participate in the community. And whereas the National Alliance on Mental Health reports one in six U.S. youth aged 6 to 17 experience a mental health disorder each year. And whereas 50% of lifetime mental illness begins by age 14 when most students are entering high school. Whereas an estimated 60% of students who do not graduate from high school also experienced emotional, behavioral, and mental health disorders according to the U.S. Department of Education. And whereas National Survey of Drug Use and Health Data shows mental health diagnoses, suicide rates, non-suicidal self-injuries such as cutting and emergency room visits for students experiencing mental health issues are all on the rise. And whereas suicide is the second leading <coughs> cause of death in the United States and the leading cause of death for youth ages 5 to 19 in Colorado and 90% of people who die by suicide have an underlying mental illness. And whereas 446 suicide assessments were administered to District 11 students from August, 20, August 2022 to April 2023, and whereas 358 warm handoffs were completed on behalf of D11 students, staff, and their families for clinical mental health support between October and April through our partnership with Care Solace, Mental Health Care Coordination Service. And whereas 33 school sites in District 11 are currently receiving at least one day of clinical mental health support for students during the school day, with additional days being heavily requested. And whereas D11 has entered into partnership with six mental health agencies over the past year to provide in school support, in school support, community and staff psychoeducation, and 
whereas the University of Maryland's Center for Mental, School Mental Health has found that educating staff, students, and parents in the signs and symptoms of mental illness is key to both early intervention and dismant dismantling the stigma surrounding health. And whereas the CSMH reports that students are more likely to follow through with mental health services in school settings and bringing mental health services onto campus enables easier communication among providers, parents, and teachers. And whereas schools that implement comprehensive mental health systems see improved academic performance, fewer special education placements, decreased disciplinary actions, and higher graduation rates. And whereas, spreading awareness of the importance of mental health can help people realize the many ways in which mental illness impacts them and those around them, and can provide the opportunity to learn about available services. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Colorado Springs School District 11 Board of Education hereby proclaims the month of May as National Mental Health Awareness Month in Colorado Springs School District 11 to shine a light on mental health in hopes to reduce community-wide stigma, provide support, educate the public, and advocate for equal health and well-being. The motion is, I move that the Board of Education adopt Resolution 2023-33 in support of Mental Health Awareness Month. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any discussion before I? No, I think we uh, we have some folks to talk. Thanks. Oh, we do. Yeah, if we could have our project work coordinator, Nicole Herrera, come forward. Hi. Thank you, Nicole. It's a long way to wait to just get voted yes. Right? <laughs> well, I'm I was sorry. Like, Man, everybody left, but it's okay. Uh, thanks for having They're me. They're watching at home. Great. Hey. <laughs> uh, so I'm Nicole Herrera. I'm the Project Aware Grant Coordinator for the district. Um, some of this will be repetitive, but I did want to highlight some of the work that we're doing in the district. Um, so every day, millions of people face stigma related to mental illness, causing many to, causing many to face their mental health challenges for years without help. Each May, Mental Health Awareness Month provides the opportunity for everyone to come together to illuminate mental health to stop the stigma. Bringing forth this awareness is crucial to helping people reach out for the assistance they deserve. Since the adoption of the Project AWARE Advancing Wellness and Resilience in Education grant, the Department of Student Success and Wellness has been able to expand mental health services for our D11 community. A couple of highlights include partnering with Care Solace, a mental health care coordination service that helps connect students, staff, and their families to mental health support. Since that partnership began in October 2022, 406 referrals have been made, or warm handoffs, and 181 of those referrals resulted in fully appointed clients. We have entered into six uh, partnerships with local mental health agencies with the goal to provide one day of clinical mental health support in each of our sites by the end of the grant cycle. Our mental health partners are currently providing services in 33 of our 54 sites and service, servicing approximately 354 students. In addition, supplemental support has been given to schools for tier two mental health interventions, such as Kelso's Choice, Calming Corners, IHT heart rate monitors, and peer mentoring. And finally, there has always been a need for continuity of care regarding mental health during the summer months. With that in mind, four of our lo local agencies, including Children's Hospital, Mindsight, ITSCO, and Burning Sage Counseling have come together to create comprehensive skill building groups throughout June and July at five D11 host sites. We have potential to serve 900 students through this programming to build and practice skills that support social, emotional, mental well-being. To stand in solidarity with our students, staff, and broader community to stop the stigma surrounding mental health, we hope to celebrate the adoption of this resolution to recognize May 2023 as Mental Health Awareness Month. By efficiently rec recognizing May as Mental Health Awareness Month, we believe we can help unite our community members with a shared vision of improved mental health and equality. Thank you. Thank you. Now, discussion, comments. Director Jurgensen. <coughs> Every time the mic turns on, I have a cough. <coughs> uh, thank you, Director Ott, for reading the resolution. And just a couple of things, uh, you know, as moving through adult years and you, you live life and you, you think that you have to solve things on your own and you think that you have to go through these um, things that you are dealing with the stressors of life on your own, and, and that, uh, that is not true. And so getting help is normal. Having a counselor that you chat with is normal. 
Asking for help is normal. We can all feel overwhelmed at times. We can all have stress from strains of relationships and uh, things going on. Please don't deal with that alone. Love and friendship are all about respect. And if you have uh, relationships that you're in that don't have that and, and you feel unsafe, please get help that you need. And then just lastly, I'll mention the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. So they are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as well as the services that we just heard about. And so please uh, don't deal with this alone. Reach out and you have people that will support you, including your D11 family. Thank you. Director Rock. Thank you. I appreciate your words, Director Jorgensen. And I'm going to repeat that number you gave, 988, for Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. I was looking it up because I had thought it had changed from its long number, 1-800. Yep, and it's very simple now, the 988. Um, so thank you to Nicole and um, Valerie Skates also, who is bringing this to us. And um, yes, you don't have to suffer. Mental health is part of being a physical being we have, and have minds. So absolutely, go ahead and get some help if you need it. There should not be a stigma for this. So thank you. Thank you. Any further comments from the board before I call for roll call? So uh, just as uh, the words that carried in the resolution itself and then some other board member comments, uh, uh, from the board, uh, uh, too often we see too many of our students going through some of these challenges. Last week I had a meeting with, uh, hopefully I get her name right, Amber Patak. I think she is the uh, CEO of Community Health Partnership. Uh, and she was here with a couple of her board members here. Uh, we had a good, um, um, it was the day that uh, there was a lot of things going on in the district. Uh, Superintendent Gall was supposed to join me, but he had other pressing agenda items to take care of in the school district. So I got to meet with her. It was a very healthy, productive conversation, and the conversation was mostly about youth mental health prevention and what we as a district can do about that and what, how other outside community partners can support us in that um, uh, endeavor. Um, and we talked about bringing other school districts together to collectively, um, if, um, other superintendents and school board members can collectively lean in to solve this problem. And one of the things I shared with her is that um, uh, this is graduation month, and just as graduation month gives me so much joy and celebrations, the exact opposite is that when I attend a funeral of a student, and I've attended too many of them in the last couple of years. Um, um, so some of our uh, young, uh, adults, youths, um, uh, as you are dealing with some of these stressors in your life, there is help out there. So please reach out. Even if it is uh, not available in your home environment, reach out uh, uh, to your friend or uh, 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 a counselor at school, a teacher at school, an adult at school. Uh, uh, something that Superintendent Gall uh, always says is we want every child to be known by an adult in our school. So. Thank you for reading that resolution. Roll call, please. Director Bankus? Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Jorgensen? Aye. Director Loma? Aye. Director Malpakum? Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Ott? Aye. I have it. The resolution has been adopted. And thank you for being here. Dr. Daniels, can you please make the motion for action item F6? I move that the Board of Education approve the board meeting. <coughs> dates for fiscal year 2023-2024. Second. Moved and seconded. This item was uh, brought in front of the board a couple of weeks back. Um, so we ha have discussed this in the past. Before I call for roll call, any comments or questions from the board? OK. Seeing none, roll call, please. Director Bankus. Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Jorgensen? Aye. Director Loma? Aye. Director Malpakum? Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Ott? Aye. I have it. The board meeting days for 23-24 has been adopted. 
Moving on to the non-action items, the first one is the Mill Levy Override Plan Amendment to program PIPs, Program Implementation Plans. So this is new information that is coming in front of the board. I'm going to turn it over to you, Superintendent Gall. Chief Otto. Thank you, Superintendent Gall. Good evening, Board of Education. Um, I have seven plan amendments that I will be presenting all under the 2017 MLO, three of which are amending existing program implementation plans, or PIPs, and four are new PIPs. I would like to take the opportunity first to share out to our viewing audience a shout to the Mill Levy Override Oversight Committee, who is comprised of all community volunteers. Most of them had conflicts tonight, but there's one with us in attendance, and I would like to give a shout out to Mr. Kaiser. This, this group, this committee, um, takes a lot of time and dedication, and it does important work to ensure taxpayer dollars are spent in accordance with the plan amendments. I think it's important that we give a little bit of background because a lot of individuals really don't understand what the mill levy override is and how it supports our district. The mill levy override or MLO is assessed from district property taxes. We have two MLOs. One is from 2000 and it is approximately $28 million. It does not have an inflationary clause and supports various programming initiatives which include supplemental funding to attract and retain teachers and support staff, reduction in class size based on board approved staffing formulas, instructional supplies and materials, teacher and teaching and learning coaches, technology one-to-one -one devices, charter school allocation, and expand student assessment and intervention support for ELL, special education, and GT teachers. The 2017 MLO provides for approximately $44.5 million, and it supports the comprehensive student support model, attract and retain ESP staff, charter allocations, and approximately $15 million in capital projects, which have realized renovations at Gary Berry Stadium, various track and fields throughout the district, air conditioning at several elementary and middle school sites, and numerous flooring projects, just to name a few. We have a citizens oversight committee comprised of district residents that ensure taxpayer dollars are being spent in accordance with the governance plan and are true to the intent of the election question. They are a recommending body to the Board of Education. Currently, the committee has approximately seven active members and is seeking community interest for membership. Just some points of clarification. There are an inflationary adjustment that applies to the 2017 MLO and unspent MLO balances. Inflationary adjustment is, uh, was last implemented by the board in 2022. The board approved an inflationary adjustment um, at 3.5%, which realizes 1,619,926 recurring revenue dollars. These revenues are proposed to be allocated to in the plan amendment PIPs 1, 3, 12, 13, and 14. Unspent MLO balances. At the end of each fiscal year following the financial audit, there is ultimately a small amount of unspent funding that was originally established to automatically go into the bond redemption payoff bucket. But we paid it in full last December <coughs> as a promise to the taxpayer in the election question. Collectively, this amount totaled $3,976,704. Now the plan amendment process is spelled out in the govern governance plan and it re is required when there is any change in funding allocation. 
So I'd like to just pause because I'm sure people are like, why haven't we done this before? It's because the plan amendment had been set up for all unspent dollars to automatically roll into the bond redemption. Well, that's paid off. So here we are. The process that coincides with the plan amendment includes a review, feedback, input, and a vote from the Mill Levy Override Oversight Committee. And it must also go to the DAC for the same input review and voting approval. Followed directly to the Board of Education for a non-action action, action uh, read and vote by the board. The, for any plan amendment to be approved by the board, it must receive five, a minimum of five votes of approval or a supermajority vote. The MLOOC held two separate meetings, one in March, March 21st, and an ad hoc meeting April 3rd to hear additional information from Superintendent Gall regarding the Mitchell Promise and Miss Sarah Carlson regarding Universal Pre-K PIPs. The plan amendments were presented to the District Accountability Committee on April 20th. I will now provide a brief overview of each of the plan amendment changes and the MLOOC and DAC noted concerns and voted outcomes. PIP 1, this is an existing PIP and it refers to the comprehensive student support model. This modification is to increase supply material services budget by $35,881. Since it has been fully implemented last year, um, we didn't update any budget. The full budget was never fully implemented. Since it has been fully implemented, the owner has indicated budget shortfalls since it has grown primarily over the SEL assessment survey, the second step mis, um, middle school SEL curriculum, and general office supplies. Both the MLOOC and the DAC voted to fully support funding this increase on a recurring basis. Plan Amendment 2 pertains to PIP 3, which is Education Support Professionals, Attraction and Retention. This amendment proposes using 700,000 of the recurring inflationary funds to be allocated into this PIP to help offset anticipated market compensation adjustments, which include an increase in the minimum wage. Both the MLOOC and DAC fully support this funding increase on a recurring basis. The next plan amendment is related to PIP 11. This PIP distinguishes a contingency reserve fund balance for non-recurring unspent funds and pays the property taxes. Previously, all unspent funds went toward the bond, went toward the bond redemption debt. Separately, resulting from unspent MLO balances identified in the annual financial audit, and the board approved inflationary adjustment in December 22. There is a total of 3,976,704 dollars in non-recurring funds. It is recommended that these funds be allocated into the existing PIP 8 capital renewal and replacement for special capital projects to directly support our newest elementary pathway schools and the remaining $2 million be placed in a new PIP to be covered shortly named PIP 15 for instruction and material purposes. Establishing this PIP the curriculum PIP 15 as a contingency reserve fund balance for non-recurring unspent MLO funds since the bond redemption has been paid in full was voted and fully approved by the MLOOC and the DAC. The next plan amendment pertains to a new PIP, PIP 12, the Mitchell Promise. This PIP is new and proposes to directly support an initiative previously approved by the use of general funds to the fund balance initiative on October 12th, 2022. Following that time, I was informed that we cannot use general fund dollars towards higher education scholarships. And they are considered higher ed because they are given to students after they graduate from K-12. 
The Colorado Revised Statute 22-32-149 was enacted in 2021, and it does allow for MLO funds to be used for this specific endeavor. It also allows fundraising to be done to pay for this type of scholarship. So the only means that the district has to pay for the Mitchell Promise is through MLO funds or by fundraising. The Mitchell Promise is a scholarship opportunity for our highest poverty high school to attend Pikes Peak State College and earn a two-year degree. This is based on a 50% match in collaboration with the Dakota Foundation providing for the other 50% match. Students must meet specific eligibility requirements to apply for this scholarship. This PIP is a pilot program for a four-year period beginning July 1, 2023, ending June 30, 2027, subject to review and approval at the end of this period. The anticipated outcome is this, that this will decrease dropout rates and increase matriculation rates annually. This PIP initially did not receive approval votes by the Mill Levy Overwrite Oversight Committee, primarily on concerns that included it was not offered to all of our high schools, and two, there was, dis there was unsupport that it was in alignment of the original voter-approved MLO language. I have received a legal reading that this that the both the MLOs, the 2000 and the 2017 MLO, can be used for this endeavor. It is within the original voter language that includes being able to support um, educational needs and re and uh, supporting student successes. Those are some of the foundational language in the voter approved. Um, mill levy that would allow this to happen and keep it within alignment. We met again on April 3rd to hear the additional information. There was a revote because new information had been introduced and the PIP had been rewritten to make it a pilot program and to include language that had been legally, we can legally do this. Both to be true to the voter um, MLO intent and to use the funds in this manner. Uh, the MLO vote was a tie. We did move it forward to the DAC. The DAC received a high rate of support in that manner. Moving to PIP 13, Preschool Enhancement to Universal Pre-K. This is a new PIP which will provide supplemental funding to serve preschool students not served through Universal Pre-K either due to not meeting the risk factors or limited state funding. Coincidentally, our demographer study identifies preschool students as a high strategy opportunity to grow programming within our elementary school communities. The recommended recurring funds from the inflationary adjustment for this PIP total $600,000. The MLOOC initially did not approve this plan amendment primarily due to lack of sufficient understanding and information of the universal pre-K program, which is new, and lack of belief that this strategy will work based on a comparison of funding for full-day kindergarten. Additional information was added to the language and uh, additional information was briefed at the April 3rd ad hoc meeting. It, a revote was taken, and this ultimately did pass by the MLOOC. It moved to the DAC and received overwhelming support of this PIP as well. Two more PIPs. The next PIP, PIP 14, is new, and it creates an undesignated inflationary fund balance for recurring funds to be held. This PIP provides um, a, a place for it to land but must be reassigned within 12 months. With the addition of PIP 3 plan amendment and the increase of the $700,000, this PIP would have a remaining balance of approximately $64,000 if all recurring dollars as a proposed assignment were approved by the board. 
The board agenda does reflect a total of $764,000 in this PIP, and that is not correct. Both the MLOOC and the DAC voted to fully support funding this increase. Finally, PIP 15 is a new PIP, and it creates into the 2017 MLO a PIP to place funding for curriculum, instructional materials, and instructional software. Right now, that is currently funded in the 2000 MLO, which does not have an inflationary clause and remains at the original funded amount from, 20, from 2000. By adding a PIP 15 to the 2017 MLO, there is now a recurring funding mechanism that if the board or as the board invokes inflationary adjustments, we would be able to put necessary funds if that would be approved by another plan amendment. Both the MLO and the DAC voted with strong support for this funding increase. At this time, this concludes my overview of all seven plan amendments. Thank you. Comments, questions by board members. Dr. Loma. After this, I'm going to change your name to Gladys Knight. <laughs> Pip, and pip, the pips, pip, right? Pip, yeah, you pip. got this bunch of them here. I don't. <laughs> Did you want to go through these by number, or can we just pick one out? Yeah, I'll come to you. Uh, are you done, Director Loma? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for bringing some levity to the board <laughs> meeting at this time of the night. Um, Director Bankers. Um, I just had a question about uh, pip number fourteen that talks about funds to be held um, and assigned within 12 months. And so how are they, uh, those funds going to be allocated? I don't, I guess I don't understand. Thank you. Sorry. Did that conclude your question, Dr. Bankus? Yes, ma'am, thank you. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. It's a great question, and what we're trying to do is create a, an account. A PIP is kind of like an account where recurring, recurring fund balance or recurring dollars can sit until a decision is made to get them assigned. Typically, recommendations come from the Mill Levy Override Oversight Committee that would have to go through this process, but once uh, once that's established, they would deplete that recurring uh, funding allocation. Um, the board, when the board votes annually whether or not to invoke inflationary funds, that's when we would receive additional recurring dollars. Otherwise, this money, there won't be money just sitting in this account. Did I answer your question, ma'am? So does that mean that the money that's collected on, on this PIP 14 would be MLO money? That it's is a correct matter. statement. Where, okay, and then we just have to decide where it's gonna fit within the spending, um, approved spending areas within the MLO. For future infl inflationary adjustments, for the one that was passed by the board in December of 2022, this, the presentations I'm making tonight are trying to allocate that $1.6 million into various PIPs. Oh, I see. Okay. Do Thank we you. know what the Go allocations ahead. into those PIPs are? Yes. For PIP 1, it's approximately 35,000. For PIP 3, it's 700,000. For PIP 12, it's 200,000. For PIP 13, it's 600,000. And I think that's I think, my uh, total yeah, amount. Those are, the, <laughs> those are the numbers that you would set. And so that, um, I think that clears up something about where the money for some of these uh, other PIPs are gonna come from. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this used to be going to the bond redemption fund Correct. in the past. And since we uh, paid off the bond redemption fund and uh, lived up to the promise made to the community, that's why. You got to spend it. Yep. That's why you have this. Right. Okay. Director Daniels. Thank, 
Thank you. I so appreciate the clarity because, of course, with the comments coming forth, I'm, I'm just needing to make sure we are not opening the door for people to come and attack <clears throat> us because they will see something wrong and then want to come and fix it and keep pointing fingers for decades. So we are clear this is not going against the voters and what they want and what they said yes to. We will not be in jeopardy of passing another bomb measure. I mean, like, the vision is there. It's always present, right? But I, I w I'll try and answer that. I'll, I'm going to respond. I'm not an attorney. I think there could be a legal argument in any situation for or against. What I have in writing from our attorney is that within the election question, we could find reasonable argument to support adding the Mitchell promise as well as the universal pre-K PIPs that are in direct support of educational needs to our students. Thank you. And one last question. Are we voting individually or are we doing a package deal here? Ton tonight is non-action and okay. next at the next action meeting, I would probably do separate individual action motions. I, can I just say I'm so concerned <laughs> because this is what causes people to come out of the woodworks and just constantly hammer District 11 as if there's been no background, nothing. And we always come off in the sight of people like we're just trying to do something unscrupulous and under the table. <laughs> it just really concerns me. So thank you for the explanation and the clarity. I really sincerely appreciate it. We're not doing anything under the table. It's being discussed completely. So. Okay. Let me recognize you. Let me recognize you before Director Daniels. I, I think the talk. comment was taken as appreciation for the depth of the report that was given by Chief Odom. Yeah. Thank you, Director. Thank you. So speaking of transparency, um, we noticed this on our board docs and just today. And I, I think for all of our public hearings, we ought to notice them in every place we notice our regular meetings. So I would request that we notice this one again, the public hearing part of the MLO. Um, and we can do that perhaps when we do action. The, in, the, if we're having a vote up here and it's a tie, it's a failed vote. So the, was the Mitchell promise? Is that the one, uh, 12? Sorry, 13? That is correct. 12. So that one failed twice in our Mill Levy Override Oversight Committee, which is our citizens' input committee. So as we talk about transparency, as we talk about trust from the public, um, are we using things the way they were intended? This one, I don't feel good about. It might be legal, but that doesn't make it right in this particular situation. I support the Mitchell promise. I would love to give those kids uh, an extra boost toward their goals and their achievement. Um, I don't think this money is the way, this, the MLO money is the way to do it. You look like you have a comment. When you're ready. Well, I, I, my mic's still green. If it'll, if uh, President Milpack and we'll keep it green, go ahead. Um, one of the comments and concerns um, that we tried to mitigate in this particular PIP is to make it a pilot program to give the opportunity for the administration to try and do some significant fundraising. I think the initial plan was to always try and find philanthropic ways to fund this, but to get it going right away, that's why we are limiting it and making it close so it will try and show that, that trust that we don't want to lose. Um, a neighboring district does use this very same concept and they fund it fully with philanthropic dollars. So that we're trying to bridge um, some time to make that happen. 
I, I just I didn't say that in my presentation. And Thank I you. Apologize. I appreciate the addition. Um, that said, I I don't. I'm glad these will be broken out because I don't know that I can support that one. Um, and again, with universal pre-K, I absolutely support our funding that, our jumping in, um, doing what we can because we know that early education has great dividends later down the road. But, and this one I, I, I'm back and forth on, but I'm not sure that I, if I were one of the committee members, I think I would have serious concerns about the, the coming back and the suspension of Robert's rules, whether or not the committee officially used the rules, Robert's rules. If you are a committee or an organization using that as your guiding principles for working through a meeting, it's up to you to suspend them. And it doesn't sound like this committee was the one that decided that. So um, I hope that Perhaps we can have you look again at these, where these funds can come th from, fundraising for one, and maybe finding something else we can fund uh, within our budget for pre the universal pre-K, and then fund something else with the MLO money, because there are other things we can use. Um, both of our speakers tonight have the history here that most of the, well, everyone on this board does not have. Um, I've walked for this and campaigned for this MLO, and I, I believe in the oversight committee. So I think that um, we need to pay attention <laughs> to that history. And Chris, can you just, can you give me the votes on the um, universal pre-K to, you, you said it passed the second time around. Can you give me the, the vote on that? From yes, the I think Mill it was. Override yeah, override sorry, committee. sorry I, PIP. Um, yep, I'm jumping back into PIP, sorry. Um, the, that would have been the universal pre-K, <coughs> so 13. From the MLO OC? It's From the on, committee, yep, and then I'll have one follow-up comment. 3-3, three, three, I think. No, that, 13. Was, that was Mitchell Promise. I think it was 4-2. But I'll, I'll go. So 12, that. you said? Um, 12 was 3-3. Three, three. Right. It was a tie. The second time. Correct. And, and then, then 13. And then the um, universal pre-K passed 4-2. Did it? OK. And so that one, that one then at least passed. Um, and I'm just going to make a note, too, with DAC. One of the concerns that was expressed to me was that, and, and I was there at the meeting, the ballot question was not presented. And obviously, it was the district side only. There was no pro. I don't know that the, I can't remember if the concern was expressed from the Millivy Override Oversight Committee. But I feel like um, maybe the DAC, these are great programs. Absolutely, we want to support them. But the DAC doesn't have the depth that the MLO Oversight Committee does. So I want to recognize that. And also just say, we're down to six people. We're supposed to have like 20 on this committee. And while we might not need 20, we could sure use more than six. So folks, we have a lot of committees. We have a lot of opportunities to volunteer. And this one needs y'all. So thank you. And there are, if I understand, are you done, Director? Yes. OK, thank you. Um, there are a lot of members on that committee who never show up. So their names are on the rules. I've attended some of the committee meetings. I've never seen these people in two years. So maybe you need to, we need to clean up some of those people. I see them at board meetings, but they don't show up at the middle of the override oversight committee meetings. So maybe we need to clean, clean that up. Dr. Loma. Um, you had mentioned that um, you're going to bring every single one of them. Uh, I, I, when, if possible, I, could we put some of those on consent, the ones that are not up for debate, rather than going every single one? That would be my first request. Uh, second, so you tell me there's six people on this committee, correct? Three, three, six people. Well, I think seven active people, only well, six the, people showed the up vote. at that time. The vote, yeah, okay. The vote. And, and um, the, the, the plan, the Mitchell plan was 200,000 matching funds. That means $400,000 that'll go to underprivileged children, 
correct? And three people who don't like it are going to stop that? Um, I, I don't agree with that. I thought that's ludicrous to me. Secondly, um, I, although I appreciate their work, we were elected. We don't have to listen to this committee. We appreciate the work, we listen to it, but it's our job to vote, not their job. Uh, so the dog should never wag, uh, the tail should never wag the dog. And so um, as far as I'm concerned, I think this is a great plan. It's a unique way to spend resources that we have to spend because we paid off a bill. Um, and so uh, I, I, um, I just um, completely disagree with the previous comments to allow three people to, to alter $400,000 to at-risk children. Just is mind-boggling to me. That's it. Okay. So a couple of things of clarity um, from you too, Chris. Um, um, the Milavi Override Oversight Committee is a recommending body, and uh, the board does have to take the vote, formal vote, finally. Yeah, but we do, um, it's a board-appointed committee. Let me, yeah, yeah. I'm not abdicating. The board is going to still vote on this. But we. It's our job, not their job. Understand. But we value the feedback that comes from, from that committee. Okay. We value the feedback that comes from the committee, and that's a recommending body. We look at the whole picture, and the board can accept their recommendations or go in a different direction. That's up to the will of the board at that time. And you also mentioned that this needs a super majority, right? Vote uh, each one of these. It's a 5-2, not a 4-3. Four, 4-3 three. Four, three is not a... Correct. Okay. I need five approving Ma votes. For the thing. Okay, now uh, I'll come back to you. Okay, let me go to Director Art, and then I'll... Go ahead. Thank you. I, I do want to note that at Mitchell, in particular, we do have, I assume, additional opportunities for college credit because we have the Wasson campus, we have- We do have concurrent enrollment and yes. early college opportunities and dual enrollment. Okay. Yes, at all our schools. And right, so those, <coughs> we have these opportunities. Again, I absolutely agree. We, this is, should be a great program. And um, honestly, it was one of the things I wanted when I ran the first time. And yet, I, I think we just, we have to pick up on the fundraising. And we should, in the meantime, if it takes a year, okay, we can emphasize the opportunities the students have before them. One of the things I hear constantly is, I didn't know I could do that. So let's spend a few thousand dollars on letting them know they can do these things and, in the meantime and get some of that in the current four years they have with us and in the meantime, we can be fundraising for these additional two years. And I have to say, while we don't have to take anybody's advice, because, yep, we can vote, uh, this MLO was passed this way. The voters said this is what they wanted, was an oversight committee. And my biggest concern is one that Director Daniels touched on. If we don't honor our oversight committee, which represents and for the record, I don't agree. If we want to talk politics, I don't agree with all these people politically necessarily. I don't know who voted which way, um, but it's, if we are gonna go for a bond this year or next or the year after, we need the buy-in from the community. We need the trust and we need to pay attention to what they're telling us. Thanks again. Okay. Can I? Yeah, I'll, I'll just wait for the end if there's other comments. Okay, okay. there are can, other comments. Can I make a comment? Sure, Because I, I, I want to kind of level set and make sure everybody knows the other piece of information that has not been shared. When the, on the May or March 21st meeting, I did reach out the next day to the chair, the vice, and the past chair, and active members to see if there's anything I could do to mitigate, manage, or eliminate the noted concerns to correct, make corrections to the PIPs to bring it back. And I was given information and I was, I was trying, because what I didn't want is to bring to 
this Board of Education something that did not have support by the MLOOC. So we made significant revisions that warranted a second vote to the Mitchell Promise in the Universal Pre-K. I'm not trying to advocate for either. I'm just trying to make sure people understand the process that was followed. They were not ignored. We obtained feedback and made edits. Okay, thank you. Director Loma, you have further comments? Uh, Director Bankus, you had a question. I have a comment. Um, one of the speakers during public comment who spoke in um, opposition to putting forth preschool and the Mitchell Promise sent out an email earlier today, or at least I ran it off today, uh, and it was the Mill Levy Override Fund as it was presented on the ballot in both 2000 and 2017. And as I read the very first paragraph on the 2017, so the 2000 had uh, 11 items listed on them. The 2017 had seven. And the first paragraph says, ballot issue number 3E, shall school district 11 taxes be increased $42 million annually, which shall be used to fund educational needs including but not limited to, and then it lists the seven. So as soon as I get to that one little phrase, but not limited to, and again, this was sent to me by one of the speakers today uh, during public comment who spoke in opposition of the uh, use of these funds. Um, I have not seen the original or the primary um, reference, but I'm making the assumption that this is correct. And when it says, but not limited to, I'm thinking that um, back in 2017, that we left an opportunity in that ballot language to give us the opportunity all these years later to say uh, needs have changed and what is it that we can do to increase the opportunities for our students. And this is one of them, or these are two of them, I guess. Uh, so to Dr. or to um, Director Ott's point about how the meeting was conducted, uh, if there are irregularities, then maybe another meeting needs to be called in order for them to mitigate the issues that arose from following or not following Robert's rules of order. But if this is truly the 2017 MLO election question is truly uh, representative of what was presented to the voters, then the words but not limited to would allow us to use these funds in this manner. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that's where probably legal uh, used the same language to provide that feedback. Yeah. Okay. So a um, couple of things here. Let's talk about uh, seeing no further questions from the board. The UPK, uh, this is coming, this request is coming because we are uncertain how the state is going to be funding UPK. And maybe there will be a little bit more clarity a year or two down the road. And maybe this. I, I think we'll have clarity sooner than that. The state is seeing that there are some gaps, particularly in the three year old program, and there are. Uh, putting together kind of a reserve contingency fund at the state level for districts to be able to um, apply or be reimbursed for. So it is being addressed by the state. There is still concern that it might not reach 100% funding depending upon district strategies, particularly in the three-year-old category. I'm the uh, regional superintendent on that subcommittee with, uh, with the state. So. Okay. Um, they, are, they are seeing that, but as is was with most of our pre-K, this is usually in, an, in the rears way to do this. So okay. whether it ever gets to 100% or not won't be known until that time. And we are um, in a position now where there are 1,200 plus families that have applied in the portal for uh, pre-K pre opportunities, universal pre-K opportunities for us next year. And so having funds budgeted will allow us to be able to hire staff, 
make the um, uh, furniture changes if we need to, and be ready for the 1,200 plus family demand that we already have in the system. Absolutely. Uh, just like every other board director has talked about, there is value in this program. I'm just talking about pre-K. This gets our kids in the school and get them ready for kindergarten. And also, the sooner you get them when they are three or four years old, then there is potential that those students are going to stay in the same school. So this is an opportunity to increase enrollment. Uh, some of the other school districts may not be doing this, so I see value in this. But um, uh, since there is considerable potential for this funding to change in the next year or two years, and we do have uh, contingency unspent money in the other side, uh, is, is, are there any restrictions in using general fund dollars to fund universal pre -care? Thank you, President Malpacum. I appreciate that question, and the answer is no. There is okay. no restriction. Okay, so is that at least something that we can consider for the next year or two until that funding stream becomes a little bit clear? Uh, use the some of the unfunding, the, the reserves the that we have. The non-recurring. Non yeah. Thank you for completing my sentence. My pleasure. Yeah. Would the board be supportive of that? And then uh, you can move the $600,000 to PIP 14, is it, where we park unspent they, money? Yeah. The, there's the non-recurring and the recurring, but I'll put it in the, the right spot. Yeah. But I mean, the $600,000 from the MLO, if it's not spent, you can park it in that. Uh, yeah. Correct. That is a okay. correct statement. And then we can figure out from the MLO, see what it can be spent on in, uh, in uh, the next uh, 12 months. Would the board be supportive of that? OK. OK, so then the universal pre-K, we can take that off the table for now. So now let's come to the Mitchum promise. Is, is that OK? That well, yes, that's what the board said right now. Yeah. Uh, they were sub so if we don't have to bring that, and it can be funded with the, so it doesn't need to come in front of the board. And then let's come to the uh, Mitchell promise. Uh, is that m something that can be funded through grant funding, like ESSER money for the first year? No, it, none of the grant funding would work for that. No. Okay. So the only resource for that would be uh, either the MLO money or donations, um, things of that nature. Correct. Okay. So just a point of clarification on grant funds. When you gr raise money, it has to be for the intended purpose identified. So you could go out and raise money, but it has to be for the sole purpose of funding the Mitchell Promise, blah, 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 blah. <coughs> okay. Well, I don't know. I thought maybe yes, sir, would is a grant fund and it would fund for a year or so. But uh, if that money cannot be used that way, that's fine. So the concern I have is this was a promise that was made. It's a promise. OK, and if you walk back that promise, you have students at this point in time at Mitchell High School who potentially are going to be graduating in a week or so looking forward to the scholarship to fund their two-year degree in Pikes Peak State College. And now we are walking back that promise. And that is a concern to me. I don't know where the rest of the board stands on it. I see the concern, the feedback that comes from the community, um, and also some of the concerns that have been expressed on the board dais. But this was a promise that was made to our students out there. Okay, Granted, that maybe we should have um, checked our P's and Q's before making that yeah, promise. And, and but, I apologize uh, yeah, for that it to is, the board. Uh, what it is. So what are the options that are there in front of us? Looks like it's limited. At this point in time, do we have enough time to uh, do that philanthropic outreach? So uh, that's a question to me, not to Chief Odom. Okay. Um, do you have any other comments? Because I have, you know. A, I don't have Okay, yeah, great. Thank you, President Malpacum. Uh, I have committed that I will, I had originally planned to start large philanthropic in year two. Um, I will accelerate that to start year two tomorrow morning. Um, this is a promise. This is uh, exactly the challenges that were felt in District 2 as they had originally funded through general fund and then found uh, that to be unsustainable due to challenges and concerns 
uh, that come from different members or different positions uh, within the community. And so they now are providing their 50% uh, match to the Dakota Foundation through philanthropic needs. Uh, this is a last dollar program for students, which also means that uh, students who are eligible will have uh, the Pell Grant funds that push in as well. And every dollar that I can raise between now and the first bill that comes in from Mitchell Promise will be spent before any MLO dollars would be spent. If I can get to 100%, I will gladly do that. Uh, I don't know if I can get there for, I believe, the 27 students that have applied for and met the conditions for the Mitchell Promise this year. Um, and, and so those are the, that's the logistics piece of this. Uh, I just want to then kind of just address the community a little bit. When we talk about uh, the risk to a bond and the, the 12 votes that we did not get, um, I like to think that the 12 votes that we did not get was for all the things that we weren't doing for our students. When I think about a break of trust and whether or not I'm breaking trust with somebody who voted in 2017 or somebody who's graduating in 2023, I will put 100% of my dollars on the student graduating in 2023. I have been brought to this district to change the vector of this district, and I can't go back to 2017, and I can't insert that question. But to be limited on the ability to make an impact for students, which should be district-wide, and I appreciate the pushback the board gave me when I tried to make this specifically just for Mitchell. To have this be limited to Mitchell is because there are limited funds available. The goal is to have a pre-K to 14 system of which I will find ways to fund the front end and the back end because our students will not be successful if we continue to limit ourselves on what we thought in 2017. I find great irony in one of the answers is we actually need a new PIP to store money that we can't figure out how to spend. Since I have arrived here, I have seen $80 million of unspent dollars come to this dais for decisions on how to better serve students. $200,000, which is a gross overestimate to what the cost will be at least in this first year and probably in the second year, for us to be able to get a philanthropic solution for this, to me, is an embarrassment. And if you're worried about votes going forward, it's not on whether or not you agreed or disagreed with three people on the MLO Oversight Committee, of course, which is not fully to capacity, and took a vote with an even number of people, which should be a Roberts rule that they can't do that, so we can actually have a final decision. But I think that the risk for this district going forward is not on whether or not you've upset those three people and people who voted in 2017, but it's if you can or cannot provide a future and a vision for the Colorado Springs School District in 2050. Having solutions for students who can't afford college as part of the things that we provide is instrumental to every one of those students that put in the work effort to get it done this year and every other student that maybe is at a kitchen table tonight that says, Mom, I want to go to Mitchell next year because that's the place where I get a chance to go to Pikes Peak State College. So now they're going to go to Harrison or they're going to go somewhere else where they know that they've figured this out. I will move heaven and earth on my side to get to that philanthropic need. I need the support of this board and the community to get a little bit of time to get that done and not break a promise. Okay, thank you. Any further thoughts or comments about this? Okay, so from what I hear, um, Chief Odom, if it's possible, um, any other thoughts or comments on any of the other PIP requests that are there. Is it okay if all of those collectively are put together, like Director Loma said, in one action item, other than now the Mitchell Promise, which is what some board members express reservations on? Is that okay? By a thumbs up. You have some question? Okay, Director Jurgensen. Is our MLO Oversight Committee meeting any time between now and when this could potentially be an action item? Next Tuesday night at 6, six o'clock here in the boardroom. I Just will not be present because I have a conflict. <laughs> I wonder what the conflict As is. As do I. <laughs> As do I. Uh, I just wonder if... Do they meet monthly? No. To, not, yes, to but fully that, what is the purpose uh, of... That question, Director. I, to discuss what Director Bankus maybe mentioned and what Mr. Gall mentioned 
and to well, potentially... it's gone through that committee twice already. So I you're understand. asking it to there's, go through it. I think there's time. new information and new rationale on the table that might be able to be discussed among civilized adults to potentially see if this is a promise we can maintain. That's my only and thought. And I also would like to add, if there's Robert's Rules of Order, that our sticking point, that should there be another meeting, then strict ad adherence to Robert's Rules of Order are in order. Thank you for letting me interrupt. <laughs> That's my thought. Director Loma. Oh, you didn't need to talk? I did not. Oh. Okay, sorry about that. Director Art. So just when you say we would put them together um, to confirm you're leaving out 12 because of the concerns and 13 because we are hoping that the pre-K can be solved elsewhere. Yes. Okay. Thank you for I, I'm, the confirmation. Yeah, I'm leaving out 12 and 13. 13, we had um, a consensus that maybe we can fund it in a different manner. So it would be putting the, all the other requests together in one motion. Yes. Are you tabling PIP 12, the Mitchell promise, until further conversation? Is, is that my understanding? No, I'm, no. I'm, we'll get to that in just a okay. minute. We'll just get to get, get to that. So all I'm talking about is your request for let's combine together PIP 1, PIP 3, PIP 11, <coughs> PIP 14, and 15. If you can combine them together as one action item for the next board okay. meeting. Is the board OK with com combining all those things? Yeah, Great. So then we have PIP 12 and PIP 13 <laughs> left. And PIP 13, we are tabling it. Okay, if I understand my Robert rules right, then when you table it, it doesn't come back until the board wants to bring it back again. Okay, let's table it. Okay, so it's tabled in perpetuity. So Thank it's you. not coming back. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> yes. I appreciate uh, it. I'm sorry, what's not coming back? Universal pre-K. We are funding it through other sources. Mi Mitchell Promise. I Mitchell thought... Promise. No, I'm oh. talking about... Yes. Okay. I'm talking about tabling universal pre-K, okay, because we have other funding resources. Now the last one that's left on there is PIP-12, which is Mitchell Promise, okay? Let that come separately to the board, and then the board has to make a decision, and you need a 5-2 vote. And before the next board meeting, Superintendent Gall is going to turn heaven and earth and see if he can find some and couch cushions, so and see if we can find an extra two hundred thousand dollars to fund it. I'm just all kidding Thank aside. You for I the understand. I understand the urgency of it, but if we cannot find it, it's a promise, and then the board has to decide from the board dais: are they willing to renege on that promise, or they consider the promise to the voters in 2017 more important? even though the language, according to legal, says that we have some flexibility. But that's each individual board member's decision on it. Correct. Is that OK with the board, as we discussed? OK, thank you. Oh, you have some. OK. If you want to table something, you need a second, and we need to vote on it. OK, that's fine. Thank you for the reminder. Director Nelson. Are we actually tabling it or can we just cancel it? Okay. Postponing we, it, my, my, okay. We, we. Well, why don't you just separate them all and just vote no on that one and it goes back and we have to fund it. So keep. Just so keep the keep whole thing the way it is and break them, okay. consent them and then bring up the Mitchell Promise and Universal Pre-K. Okay. And then Fine. you don't have to. But, and, and you'll vote on that at the next board meeting. Correct. On June 14th. Yes. Whenever it is, the next board meeting. So bring back PIP 12, PIP 13 separately. More than likely, uh, at least one of those PIPs, we got an alternate source of funding. And the second one, we will discuss it as an action item before going forth. Mm -hmm. Tabling, got postponing, it. pulling, I don't know, okay, at this time of the night. Uh, Okay. June 14th. Yes, uh, June 14th. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. No, we are not tabling anything. We are just get, getting everything back. Okay. 
Okay, now we move on to student fees, fines, and charges. Thank you for that robust discussion. I turn it over to Superintendent, Superintendent Call. This looks like student fees, back. fines. Thank yeah. you. Good evening, Superintendent Gall and Board of Education, and thank you for allowing us this opportunity to present you with the proposed student fees for the 23-24 school year. In reviewing these documents, we hope that you will notice the significant reductions in student fees that have been not only taken but maintained over the past few years. In fact, most fees are now only for extracurricular activities that students and families may choose to participate in. And as always, we've noted any changes in red for the upcoming year. We'd also like to remind you and the public that no student is ever denied access to an activity based on an ability to pay a fee. Schools work all the time, one-on-one -on -one and privately with individual students and families to either apply a sliding scale based on need or to waive the fee completely depending on the situation. We'd also like to point out that up to, aligned with updated policy, we no longer charge fees for technology use except in the case of damaged or lost materials. And those fees are now standardized across the district by policy JSE4. The area superintendents, as well as uh, representatives from several departments who have fees on those documents, are in attendance this evening to answer any questions that you may have regarding proposed student fees. Thank you. Board members, any questions, comments on the fees? Thank you. Yes. Okay, go ahead, Director Bankus. Um, I'm looking at, can I, I'll just start with Martinez. Um, arts Integration Pathway, did I, 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 it's a $500 fee. Is that a misprint? Can you all share with me which one you're looking at? I'm sorry. It's 50. It's on, um, yeah, elementary school For student Martinez. fees. It is 50. It is 50. Yes. And what, what is that for? What specific? I wish that um, Area Superintendent Joyner were here this evening to answer <laughs> okay. that. We can certainly get that answer to you. Okay. So every student would have to pay that fee because that's an art integration school? I think we need to get further information to okay. you on that one. Would it be acceptable if I asked um, Area Superintendent Joyner to send all seven of you an email with that? Yep, yeah, perfect. perfect. Thank you. I also have a question about Holmes Middle School. Field trip went from $35 to $250. Where are they going? Area Superintendent Comfort is going to take that one. Okay. And while we're at it, Doherty and Mitchell, um, we're not ch charging band fees, and now they're charging $150 each. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. I thought, I'm sorry. That's okay, Director Binkus. Uh, to speak to Holmes, uh, Holmes is our, our one and only middle school that attends the high trails uh, overnight field trip. And so that, that cost, as you'll see with our elementary schools, um, is in relation to that, to that field trip. So that's, that's why that cost is there. It, they didn't do it before. That's why it went from thirty-five to two hundred and fifty. That that is correct. Oh, I see. All right, thank you. You're welcome. And you had a question about Doherty and Mitchell, something. Doherty and Mitchell, yes, they they were not charging for band, and now they're charging one hundred and fifty each. Um. I, I can answer this. Uh, to my knowledge, we've always charged some kind of band fee because it covers the competitions that don't occur in the Pikes Peak region. Um, and we've brought it down um, over the past couple of years. It used to be 225. It's now 150. Oh, I think maybe the chart was wrong. It looked like it was a brand new fee. No. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are you done with your questions, Director Mankus? Yes, that takes care of my fees. Back to Nelson. Um, I, I just have a question about overall, as a district, 
I know that previous administration wanted to lower fees for our students, which is a great, um, you know, great place, uh, like the heart is in a great place to want to do that. But I do have concerns about whether it's um, logical from a business perspective, I guess, that considering we are a declining enrollment district, and I don't even know the amount of money that we're talking about. So it may be, as Mr. Gall likes to say, budget dust and not really that impactful to the district overall that we can continue it. But um, I just wonder, I know, I believe District 11 is unique in how we handle our fees compared to um, area school districts. And so I just wondered, I don't know that you would even have this information tonight, but I guess I would like to gather more information before we vote on this for the board to consider if budget-wise it makes sense to continue in this vein or if we need to kind of take a hard look at the numbers and, and see if it still makes sense as a district since we are hopefully coming out of declining enrollment, but... Um, not quite there yet so I think what I can share in terms of context would be that the place that we've really worked to reduce and eliminate fees over the past several years is in the um, supplies and materials that are required for a student to participate in a course okay so we do not any longer allow for principals to charge a workbook fee okay. um, or to charge uh, a lab fee for mm -hmm. science those are places where schools are appropriately funded to provide the materials that students need and truthfully we should not be charging fees sure. in those areas i agree i agree definitely i mean i'm just looking at like under athletics, it says that there's a family maximum of $200. Um, and I'm not speaking to the family situations that are free and reduced lunch and would qualify for that sliding scale. I'm speaking to the families that are not in that category that, um, my personal opinion, I have two children, and if they want to participate in like three different sports, then that's on me to be able to uh, to cover that. And if I if they if I can't afford that, then we have to make some hard choices as a family. I don't know why the district is as compensating for that when it is extracurricular. And um, again, maybe it's budget dust, and the the amount isn't really even worth talking about. But I just wonder if it makes business sense. In terms I'll of- I'll just interject. I think the business sense it makes is that we know that students that have access to an extracurricular or sports are much more engaged in their academic environment. Uh, we had put forth earlier in the year, and we're not quite able to execute it this year, an idea of a club or a sport event for every middle schooler and above. Uh, we are still working on it. Uh, our athletic director, Chris Knowles, back there. Um, we know that providing these types of opportunities, have children stay more engaged in the school. Um, and we can get the numbers uh, to run them to hopefully get to a budget dust place, mm -hmm. but we see it as an investment, not a cost. And I guess I'm thinking in terms of um, the, the hypothetical situation I'm thinking of is a student that's wanting to do three sports, you know, maybe they only do two, and they're still engaged. It, uh, Again, it, it may not be even worth talking about, but. In terms of a, a, a large overall school district budget, the number of families who access, uh, you know, who reach that, that maximum amount and then don't pay additional athletic fees, um, we can certainly get a number on that, but it's going to be incredibly minimal in terms of a, a large athletics budget, a large district budget. Well, and I guess that, Really, the reason I am asking is because um, the board received an email about concerns that this is provided for athletics, but why not band? Why not theater? And so I'm just imagining that, yeah, we should be um, spreading this to all categories, all extracurricular activities. And so then my mind went to, okay, what is that going to actually cost if we say there's a $200 maximum for any extracurricular activity for a family, not a student? Um, I just, I don't know what that would look like. Because I'm seeing, I, I believe I saw in here that there is a theater cost 
uh, mm -hmm. now I can't find it, but I think it was like around two hundred dollars, and um, hockey is two hundred, so you could easily hit that over two hundred mark, I imagine. And mm -hmm. so, just how do if we are going to do this, we need to do it for everybody, and what does that look like? And then cost wise, if we can afford it, and if we can't, then I would say we maybe need to rethink doing it for just a few. So what I'm, I'm hearing is that you'd like us to bring back um, something around a $200 maximum for extracurricular per student and what the impact of that would be on our budget? Well, currently it says family maximum for athletics, mm -hmm. um, which now I'm seeing on a different line, a 250 number, so... There oh, are certain, different uh, middle yes. school, high school. Okay, so um, to answer your question, I don't know about per student. We'll keep it current with what we're doing of per family. And if we did, if we applied that to all extracurriculars, I don't even know if you could figure that out really, but. We can make an attempt. Yeah, I mean, I just think if we're gonna do it for one group, we should do it for everybody. And if we can't afford it, then we might need to rethink what we're doing currently. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the will of the board first? Well. That, that was a request made by one board director. Is that something the board is interested in having no. that information? Uh, so, so I'm asking for us to understand what the cost to the district would be if we applied the athletics family maximum um, ca amounts to all extracurricular. So a family that their students are in theater, that their, their students are in band, um, that we consider applying it to all. And if we can't afford that as a district, then we might need to rethink how we handle it for just athletics. Because it, it just, um, I see that as being kind of a discrepancy that we're, do, we're doing. And again, I don't know if it's budget dust or if business-wise, that's something we need to reconsider and come in more alignment with surrounding school districts on how they handle these things. Are you suggesting $250 maximum for all of the activities or $250 maximum? No, I'm for saying apply what we're currently doing to athletics. So for each grade level or middle school, high school, it's different. So I'm not saying a specific number. Let's apply the concept that athletics, families can reach a maximum. If we apply that to all extracurricular, theater, band, then what would that potential cost be? Okay. I don't even know, like I said, if you can really figure that out. I don't know. I <laughs> we'll attempt. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Are you guys tracking what I'm asking? <laughs> Yes, uh, I'm not sure what the budget impact is. I don't know how athletics covers all the extra costs that after 250 maximum for a family. I don't know what the cost for athletics is or what for how much it's going to impact the overall budget. Uh, there are often even I talked to an orchestra teacher uh, just a few days back and he was talking about so many instruments mm -hmm. that in his uh, high school, he needs replaced band and orchestra instruments. So if we are going to put maximum, like what Director Nelson is asking for that, are we going to have, and we are going to direct funding to fund the student fees, which we are not going to be collecting, when are we going to replace these instruments? So, but uh, is that the will of the board, uh, as far as what Director Nelson asked, to put a maximum on, um, um, each one of those uh, subcategories, like what we are talking about, the music and um, performing arts. Yeah. Go ahead. First, I, I worry, I, I think it's a great question, and I support asking the question. And then, then discuss, when we have an answer, perhaps discussing the cap for each level. Um, two thoughts. One, I worry how much time finding that answer might take. And so I don't know if we want to say look for two hours and then quit looking. I mean, it because when I think of how, how that 
you could approach that question, you have to look at all the students in theater. Yeah. How many of them paid the full fee? How many of them had other theater experiences that then they reached that maximum? And then how many of them played a sport or three? And how many of them went on to band? And, and how many families and, and family kids can have different last names? I'm sure we can figure out that they're in the same family, but that's yet another step um, spread across you know, the three levels. So I just worry how much work we're asking our superintendent to direct someone to do. I think we could take a, just a large swath at it by participation and see if we can just put a number on it. And so not who did or who didn't, but what if? Mm -hmm. What if we limited the you know 40, uh, however many children were in the North Middle School event that many of us were there that got us to a place that we used non-recurring dollars in this year's budget to say, here's $5,000 to ensure that um, per middle school for you to be able to put on performances. I think we could take a pretty quick swath at this to bring it back as new item as it comes to action at the next board meeting. Okay. Okay. Do you guys? Yeah. Okay with it? I'm okay or? with asking the question. Yeah, if it's a, if it's a big, big question level and we don't have to get into too much gory detail and then maybe hold off um, the decision for capping until we hear that. Yeah. But I, I appreciate that idea um, because every student should be able to pursue their big dream in, in maybe three sports, which when you think about it, that's, that could be one in the spring and one in the fall and mm -hmm. something that overlaps the summer or something like that yeah. too. So there's so many opportunities. Is that the will of the board? So to get that information, because this is a task you are giving to superintendent mm -hmm. and his team. Director Daniels. Thank you. I wanted to also note in that um, the email, the parent was asking in regards to band, more times than not, band members will participate in so many different parts of band because there's symphonic, there's orchestra, there's color guard, marching. there is, um, yes, marching, there is also the competitions that happen, and that's not including uniform. So they could literally pay a good 500 plus just for <coughs> one student to do multiple fall and spring. And of course, then there's summer practice, all of that good stuff. So how would it look for participation in that, that category specifically because it requires so many pieces? And she also noted that doesn't include bringing food mm -hmm. and volunteering to serve the students. For the, so I just wanted to add that portion to, I'm sorry, the extra work that you're taking on, but thank you for finding out. Okay. Any more questions on these? Uh, just a quick question for me. Is Coronado not going to have a yearbook? I mean, I, I see like the $85 fee just gone. I'll, I'll have to find out. Okay. I mean, maybe they, they're all getting free yearbooks. I don't know. But there is no uh, charge. It's been removed. So. And all the other high schools are up to $85. Maybe in the spirit of equity, we need to remove it for all the schools. Then. <laughs> Director Art. Thank you. I had a couple of questions also from the high school um, pages. High school student fees for Pikes Peak State College, Coronado and Odyssey appear to be dropping their fees. And I was curious why that might be. Are they no longer offering options or are they, um, are, is it free? And that's on the third page under testing and college credit fees. Are you talking about only for Coronado? Well, it looks like Coronado um, used to be up to $210, and that, those lines have been crossed out. Yeah. And the same is true under Odyssey. Yeah. So I'm curious why, when the other schools still have those fees. We'll get a follow-up. Thank you. The f next question would be, um, why so many fees for art classes for Mitchell and not the other schools? 
Mitchell is working to expand their art programming options and will need to build materials and supplies for students. So we're doing that on the back of the students? Partially. The school will fund some of it as well. I, I, I would love to see some of our MLO money go for that. <laughs> or something. Uh, it just seems like... It can't go that I'm not sure I could get a meeting scheduled and get four votes. Sounds so. like they're meeting next Tuesday. Let's give it a try. Great. I, and and I, I don't, you don't have to take that as direction, but I, we have to certainly do replacements at the other schools. I remember <coughs> this being part of the conversation a couple of years ago um, that, yeah, if a student's going to take one of these classes, um, it would be nice if it weren't expensive. So we, uh, I'll make a, um, an offer to the board, um, which is we'll take a look at this and look for some uh, opportunity and uniform, I can't quite say that word, uniform ways at which families are seeing and feeling this. Uh, having to pay for art supplies at Mitchell but not having to pay for art supplies at Doherty is not projecting um, what we care to show our families about our commitment to the spaces that we can allocate dollars. So we'll take a look at that line by line and make sure that if art supplies is an issue and we can't find the appropriate funding for that, and we have to ask families for it, that we're asking for that consistently or with uh, clarity. I sure hope all those other high school's parents don't come back and blame that on me if you decide to raise the fees there. No, I would I, prefer I think, to see I think, that. I think we've also made it very clear this evening that we are not quite at full efficiency of spending dollars that our community has provided. I forget quite the number of dollars that we've just put into the MLO, but I can say that if the board doesn't support the MLO for the Mitchell Promise, I know of $200,000 that are immediately available. Um, and so that is um, not trying to make a horse trade there, but there are opportunities for us to be able to find a way that actually it doesn't end up costing people more. Hopefully it costs people less. Thank you. And just one general note as far as uh, like fees and capping and if a s students have so, so many different talents and as many opportunities as we can give them and not... Um, penalize them for being poor. That's, that is an ideal, I think, and, and that when we talk about equity, um, if a student can play, for example, three sports, and their parent might need to decide, well, I can't let you play three, um, but if they have scholarship material on all three, and that's the difference between them going to school, you know, down the road, I, I like to keep as a cap, if at all possible, um, just as one further step. And I know that you, had, you, you led with nobody um, doesn't get to do something Correct. because they can't afford it. So Correct. I appreciate that, and I appreciate that being right up front. So thank you. Okay. Uh, one more question for me. <laughs> All the computers that the children take home, the students take home, um, they are all, if they get returned broken or damaged or whatever it is, is that listed here somewhere? No, that is in policy JSE4, which outlines all of those replacement and repair costs uniformly across the district. Okay, perfect. And Melissa Smeen gets the credit for that. Okay. Any further comments or thoughts from the board on this? So. You've got received some feedback, so you've got some time. If you need to send emails to the board with all the information, so be we it. Or if it has to circle back at the next board meeting as action item. <laughs> this has got to be adopted by the next board meeting, mm -hmm. so we have um, um, these fees set for the next academic year. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the docket is uh, Dr. Greg X, as always. Uh, uh, he is at the very end of the board meeting. So Everybody's leaving. Yes. Policy GBC, whistleblower protection uh, policy. So this policy came in front of the board as a non-action item. I think, uh, I, I, remember, I don't remember the exact date now, a couple of months back, something, or a month and a half back, whenever it was. And the board did not have time to uh, look at it at the time we had to 
postponed that item and uh, then we discussed it at the work session and the board provided some guidance at that time to get some legal review and input on it and now you have that legal review and input and feedback. Go ahead. Correct. Uh, you covered it very well, President Malpakam. Uh, tonight we have three versions of policy GBC, GBC, whistleblower protection. It is a new policy, as was mentioned. Policy uh, outlines a process for reporting violations of federal and state law and regulation, and it rep protects reporters who do uh, report uh, illegal activity. The policy is a new policy designed to build trust with the community and to provide safe and professional organizations. You have three versions in your packet tonight. Version 1.0 is the initial draft version that came from policy committee with red lines. 2.0 contains language uh, from administrative revision after the April 19th work session. And 3.0 contains updated language uh, that had been uh, discussed and added to the legal review to make sure that the policy aligned with applicable state and federal law. Thank you. Okay, board member comments, feedback on this. For the whistleblower policy. For the whistleblower policy. Okay. Basically, you, so you're writing something that we can't vote on. It's law. I mean, we vote, but it's it's law. We we. Well, there are specific laws in the state of Colorado. Right. Um, the, the, the current whistleblower law in the state of Colorado is actually applicable to state agencies, uh, does not cover uh, school boards. Mm. So we wanted to make sure that by uh, state and federal law, we weren't getting uh, the board and the district in any kind of legal. Okay, so good. So uh, it's my understanding we also have a state bill at this point in time, could you? Yeah, there is a Senate bill, Senate Bill 23-111, uh, the Protection for Public Workers Act. There are some provisions in that uh, that uh, are applicable to reporting uh, workplace conditions uh, as well as um, uh, protecting uh, those workers who do report that. It provides a mechanism for reporting. Uh, that is awaiting the governor's signature. Uh, we obviously need, would, would need some time to look deeper into that and to see how that would be applicable for us. Okay. So would it make sense, and I'm asking the board this, um, to wait till that bill is passed and see how that is applicable to us before this comes to the board as an action item? Um, Director Jokinson, I thought you had a comment. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to mention a comment before your question. <clears throat> I appreciate uh, I appreciated the cross references um, and the delineation that Dr. X provided me in mentioning what a violation is versus you know because I my question was would this work for district policy and he said no this is for what the purpose is in that first paragraph so and he he then directed me to the cross references here that said. And if you are dealing with, you know, something ethical or safe and secure or conduct and responsibilities, you would you would maneuver through those existing policies. So um, this could be a, a piece that directs uh, people who are wondering what they what they should do, um, regardless of 23-111. Um, but I would be interested in seeing what this bill looks like and if we can not be redundant in policy, then that might also be something we consider. Okay. Thank you for your feedback. <clears throat> Any other board member thoughts or comments on this? Director Nelson. I support the idea of um, waiting to see what the state comes out with, and then we'll have a better idea of what we would need to do with this uh, policy. We definitely uh, support the, uh, the concept it's just that we want to see what the state's doing. So I give a thumbs up to, to okay. waiting. Any further thoughts or comments on this? Director. Do you want a motion to postpone it? Yes. Uh, if that's OK with the board, but well, go ahead and make I the motion. I could make the motion. We yep. could discuss it after it gets a second, yes. et cetera, et cetera. OK. So I, don't, I didn't write anything formal, but um, how about I plan to postpone this 
indefinitely for Superintendent Gall to examine the new law and perhaps go back through policy committee before bringing back to the board with a better understanding of what that law, how it impacts us. Yeah, so you we moved and seconded. Now we can open it up for some We're discussion open. with the understanding probably this is not going to come back until the fall sometimes because you don't, that policy committee has completed the work. So you need some time to understand this new law. So probably this is not going to come to the board again till September or October. Yeah, policy committee would not, would not meet again until the start of the next school year. Okay. So I just want the board to know that this will probably circle back September, October. Uh, if it does at the time, it may have a revised look based on the state law uh, and going through the policy committee. You good with that? Okay. Moved and seconded. No. Uh, you want to, okay. No, we don't vote, we just. Yes, we do. We do. No comments. I have comments. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just that if you find that the sure. law gets passed like next we're week and we're, then we're, we're, we're you can make adjustments to the policy yeah. and it makes sense to just go ahead and bring it to the board at the next board meeting in June, I mean, I don't know. Does it make sense to wait for policy committee if, if we're just stating what the law is? I just don't want to delay it if, if it's pretty clear that the law is what we should just do. Yeah, I can speak with Superintendent Gall once we get some information and then okay. I can have him communicate with the board okay. uh, if it's ready to go before yeah. that. Yeah, sounds great. Dr. Rock. Thank you. I did mention the policy committee in the motion partly because I want the feedback of some of the employees that are represented there that brought the whistleblower policy to the board as well. I, I know Director Jorgensen was one of the, you originally made the request and I appreciate your flexibility, um, but it also was coming, some of the language and concerns were coming from employees. So I would be interested in hearing from them through the policy committee. Which, which circles does, back to the question, That's the original thing that it probably won't come to the board till September. Right, but in the meantime, we'll have a new law. So there's that. You and we do have the other policies. Okay, Dr. Nelson. I guess I'm thinking if it's law, then like, yeah, we want to hear their feedback, but if it's law, <laughs> then I, I don't know why we would delay it till September if it's law and it's clear. So we'll just have to see, I guess, what this law says. And if it makes sense, exactly. if, they're, if it's very clear on this is what we have to do, then we'll follow it and we'll adopt it sooner but if there is like, oh, it doesn't address these things over here, then yeah, we'll bring it to the policy committee. So. Well, somebody has got to amend the motion then because the motion that She said, was, or perhaps. Or perhaps. She said perhaps in her motion. Okay, so. great, then great. <laughs> we got some flexibility. <laughs> okay, can I call for, Director Long? Go ahead. I just want to be clear. We're not, we're in non-action, we're gonna take a vote. So you're telling me Right now, this is precedent, I just want to be clear, that if I make a motion at any time in the meeting and I get a second, we're going to vote on it. For, okay. Is that what you're telling me? Because we're making, we're not, this is not an action. We shouldn't be voting. But we, we are making an action to postpone I, it. I understand that. I'm just, want to, I want to qualify this. So you're saying that at any time during the meeting, if I want to make a, a vote, I can take a vote as long as I get a second. Are you, uh, no, it doesn't matter, no, 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 because you're, you're setting a precedent right here. I well, just want to be mean, sure that if this is a okay, precedent, I want to be okay. sure it's a precedent. I, I understand it. I mean, I, under Robert's rules, are we good? We can. Yes. Okay, we're talking about postponement. A motion was made, it was seconded. I, 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 okay, I, I understand that. Okay. But there was previous statements from this dais that we can't do that. So I just want to be clear that if it's possible, it's possible. Okay. That's a good thing to know. We can have that conversation no, on the no, side. We had it. I'm, I'm just, uh, that's fine. I don't re remember when it was made, what conversation you're referring to. Roll call. Director 
Director Bankus. Director Bankus, are you there? I call the question. <laughs> We're not doing that. Okay. The she, she question. Can't, there's a motion, a live motion on the table. You can't call the question because I mean, unless she's well, calling I the question. Well, I want to know what the question is. She wants to know what the question is. Oh. We're voting to postpone this policy until we see what the state comp comes out with it's at the governor's desk we're just waiting to see what it says so we're we're yeah. making a motion to postpone <coughs> so that it doesn't go automatically to action at the next board meeting can we have uh secretary secretary to the, the board olson read back her best understanding or i will restate to the best of my ability we can capture it uh, it's all recorded so the motion well, it should be captured and then then no if you're gonna do it it should be captured written and stated and second, if we're going to do this, do it. You want the motion to be repeated right now? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it the right way. Okay. Melissa? Do you recall what the motion was, Director? I was going to see what, Mel what Melissa may have written down. And if not, I will. So what I wrote down was that you moved to postpone indefinitely, including a review from policy committee. Perhaps. The motion. Okay. To approve the whistleblower protections. But if you'd like to restate I'll, I'll elaborate, elaborate just a little bit. So I moved for sure to postpone indefinitely. And I'll add the part until the superintendent can take the time to examine the law and, deter and perhaps run by the policy committee. If necessary. I'll say as needed. How's that? To, <laughs> to determine the impact of the new law on our district and this policy. How's that? Beautiful. Thanks. You, you agreed to second it before. You're oh, good second, at that the second, second time. Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, does that help, Director Bankus? Yes, thank you. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Director Daniels? Aye. Director Jorgensen? Aye. Director Loma? No. Director Malpacum? Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Ott? Aye. So the ayes have it. What about motion was made? I can't repeat it now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, it's both postponed. Uh, moving on to the next item, uh, policy <coughs> AKB, parent partnership policy. Yep. policy. This is a new policy that came in front of the, uh, this was a new <coughs> policy that um, went through the policy committee. It uh, all originated at the work session on um, when the five essential data was presented. And there was a robust discussion at the time uh, about the parent engagement. And uh, Director Nelson um, uh, offered to um, put in the work to come up with the language for this policy. And then it went through the policy committee. And now it's in front of the board. That's my understanding. Go ahead. Yes, uh, policy AKB parent partnerships is being recommended for adoption by the Board of Education. The policy establishes the foundation for the partnership between the district and parents. The policy draws on existing policy principles to provide alignment across all policy sections and regulatory practice, as is evidenced by the extensive cross-reference section. The policy also mirrors language found in other foundational A-series policies. This policy also received some legal review. Okay. And the language that is there on the board docs is after the legal review. 2.0. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Comments, thoughts, questions, discussion? Director Nelson. I'm not sure. Maybe you already said this, but I believe the intention was that we would bring this to the work session next week to wordsmith so we don't have to necessarily go into a lot of detail right now as it's late, but... If, if it is the will of the board, thing. that's what, uh, if it is the will of the board and, you know, if majority on the board feels that this need to be wordsmithed, then it can certainly come back, uh, depending on how the conversation evolves. Does that answer your question, Director Nelson? Yes, I just was letting the other board members know that I assume there will be uh, okay. changes. If so it is, then an we can bring it back to the work session, okay? Oh yeah, work session. <laughs> um, just I I I think that 
and I stated this before when, in the work session when you after you volunteered to do it, I think that we cover pretty much everything that is in here and in, in other policies, in our um, you know, home district student engagement, parent engagement. Um, at the same time, I know that we can, that parent engagement, of course, is incredibly important. And so after thinking about it some more, I thought, you know, any tool in the belt is probably a good, is good to have. If it's this kind of hammer or that kind of hammer, maybe not. It, it's, it's a little repetitive. But that said, um, well, and I, I think maybe we could bring it or, or combine it with another policy. And I, I want to say that was, no, I'm not going to even say because I can't remember which one it was. It's one of the ones quoted on the back, um, back, back page. I do want to maybe t take a crack at it wordsmith-wise because, as I mentioned to you earlier, the number seven, like the board and district seek to provide impartial learning environments free of ideological and political advocacy. I do worry that we have to discuss political advocacy as, as a form of change in our democracy. So, and I think we have a, a common understanding of what we're really talking about with political advocacy, but I just wonder if we can wordsmith it in such a way that that would be better. Um, and instead of maybe impartial learning environments, I would say maybe we could use supportive, um, because impartial suggests we don't care one way or the other if you succeed or fail. And again, it's just wordplay, but um, yes, I, I would support the idea of taking it to a work session. Are you done, Director? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Director Jorgensen. Uh, my, my wordsmithing would be brief, and it would be at the top of page two <coughs> under the parents, uh, the board and the district encourage parents to, I would just add on bullet point four to help create a, a safe and positive learning environment. So just add the word safe and, and that would be my only edit. I think it stands alone as it, as it is here. Okay. The one that says instruct their child, that's the one that you're talking yep. about? Yep. Okay. To put safe and positive learning environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Create a safe and positive okay. learning environment. Is that uh, adding safe and positive to bullet number four? If I can get a thumbs up on it. Okay. I have one, two, three, four. Okay, great. Could you capture that language? That's the only one that comes from Director Jurgensen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and um, there was other mention about going to a work session. Um, is there support to take it to a work session to wordsmith it? You are not going to wordsmith it. You are done with the language. If Director Art and Director Nelson wants to wordsmith it a little bit and that comes in front at the work session and then it comes <coughs> at the next uh, board meeting for adoption, the work session would be next week. Okay, is that Director Nelson, uh, or I'm just going to ask, is that the majority will of the board at this time? Director Bankers, do you have any comments on this? I want to go back to um, number seven when we talk about impartial. Impartial means that you don't advocate or that you don't sway one way or the other, but you give a balanced approach. So providing a balanced learning environment uh, free of advocacy. So to participate in our um, representative government, it is, and when we ask kids in ELA to hone their writing skills, we ask them to write persuasive papers. And in that, they take a stand and they are learning how to defend themselves when they do mock trials, when they go to competitions they all have to take a stand and support it. Whether that is advocacy or not is, um, is provided through the student. So we want to provide an impartial learning environment uh, free of ideological and political advocacy means that teachers give students the opportunity to use the resources and the skills with guidance through them 
but not to move them in one way or the other. So um, I'm good with free of ideological and political advocacy. Okay. Okay, great. Any further comments? Um, we have a couple of at least board directors expressing an interest to bring this to the work session uh, to wordsmith it if necessary. Now, at that work session, we can revise it. We don't have to revise it based on the majority will of the board at that time. Do you have any other comments, Director Nelson, or you? Um, I mean, because you brought this to the table, so. I mean, I just, um, I assumed we would want to bring it to a work session, and if that's not needed, then great. Um, but I know Julie had some things that she wanted to bring up, so even if it goes really quickly, we can't, we have a work session in between our next board meeting anyways, so. Um, okay. Yeah. And I, I realized I didn't, I don't know if I should have given some context, or maybe that would make more sense for when we actually adopt it. Okay. The work I put into it. So I'll just wait and discuss how it came about at that time. Okay. So if it's the will of the board, I will put this at the work session next week. And board members who want to provide some feedback, uh, how do we do that? Um, uh, do they, like the Google Docs that you we create? We can't do that. We can't do that, no. okay. So individual board members who just create their own version and break it out there with revisions and then we go through it and get thumbs up or not. Yeah, the, we, could, we would have a, a master one at the work session and everyone could bring their, their drafts. Okay, so I hope it's not major revisions that we are spending considerable amount of time on at that time. So um, if it is going to be minor work, then so be it. Otherwise, we will move through quickly to see where the will of the board is and move on. There is some, um, uh, this policy was put into place and I appreciate the work that you put into it too, too Director Nelson, and uh, the policy committee looking at it and providing some feedback, and then the legal team looking at it. There is value in this. Uh, we want to, as I said, even in my board member reports, we want to honor the role of parents in our school district level. Um, uh, over and over again, parent engagement translates into improved student achievement in our schools. And maybe some of it is in other policies, but this still codifies everything in the basic foundations and commitments under CDC, and that's where we put this. And maybe bits and pieces of it are maybe in other policies, and that's where it's cross-referenced out there. But I can't remember any policy where we are asking parents to partner with us and encourage them to ensure that their students have attendance, ensure that the students have um, uh, classroom behavior, uh, which is addressed by the parent side. I can't remember any policy. Yeah, and the, a point for cross reference. So I see certainly great value in this policy, but I'm just speaking as one board member. Okay, with that, it's coming as a work session. At, uh, I will put that as a work session for the um, next week's board agenda. With that, um, request for new agenda items from board members, um, understanding that we are pretty much at the end of the year, so. Okay, calendar review. I do want to inform board members or at least remind board members that um, you have a couple of weeks to complete the <coughs> visit to the schools that you have been assigned. I don't know where each one of you are, so hopefully you can take the next couple of weeks to, uh, I've got one school left, so I hope to complete that over the next week or so, or maybe tomorrow. So um, I'm just reminding all the board members to please complete that, uh, because that is a commitment that we did make. Calendar review, uh, Wednesday, May 17th, right now, we have um, a special meeting that day so it will be a board meeting, but without the bells and whistles, all the things that come with it. And 
possibly potential items would be the executive session that will be scheduled in front of it to uh, get updates on um, negotiations. And the second part of it would be um, uh, at the board meeting itself, we will get the, the uh, non-action, the board budget um, will be there. And then at the work session, we have the policies right now th that is um, uh, AKB that's coming up and also GBEB could be potentially coming up at that policy, which is the uh, staff contact policy. Um, the reason that d that didn't come up was here at this time was because that already has come as non-action in front of the board. So um, the only reason to bring that would be if it is action. I wanted to make sure that uh, if there is any revisions that uh, board members have a work session to do it, just like wordsmithing. So the staff con the staff contact policy and also AKB will be there at the work session tomorrow, uh, uh, work session on 17th. And then um, uh, we will get a report on um, special programs, right? Superintendent call that would be SPED, uh, GT, and uh, ELL, and all those things at that work session that day. And then uh, the 18th, 19th are graduations. And then the week of the 24th, we don't have board meetings at this time scheduled. Um, it should say no meeting the week of May 20, yeah, May 22nd, you got that right. And then we have May 31st, which is the end of the month. I'm not sure we need a meeting at that time. If we do, I will let you know. Director Art, do you have a comment? Yes, just a note um, to the public, the town hall meetings, I wanted to just mention that as a reminder that we as a board won't necessarily be there. Some of us I'm sure will be in attendance because that's just how <laughs> I know several of us are from seeing everybody at the different events. Um, but the plan is to discuss how to align the educational spaces, i.e. our school buildings um, and and gen our general sites with our academic needs. And it's on our website, d11.org, May 15th, May 16th, and May 8 17th, with a virtual meeting on May 18th. Thank you. OK, thank you. May I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. Let, let me recognize you, Director Daniels. OK. Director Daniels, could you please I move make that the Board of Education adjourn? Second. Moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Director Bankus? Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Jorgensen? Aye. Director Loma? Aye. Director Malpacum? Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Ott? Aye. So we are officially adjourned at 10.22 p.m. Yay.